All right, we're rolling. Paul, my friend, thank you for being here. What a pleasure, Connor. It's great to see you again, man. So we are going to talk about your your newest book, your 59th book. <laughs> but who's counting? That's right. That's right. 59th book, Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Catholic Faith. Are we alone in the universe with God and the angels? Question mark. So um, we're going to talk about this, and I got a ton of questions um, about the book and even beyond. But, you know, I wanted to begin by talking about, you know, why you're qualified to write this book. Um, this is a tricky subject. It's, a, it's an unusual topic. But um, you have real credentials. You're a real theologian, right? You're a Ph.D. in theology. Um, but not just theology, more of a historical theology. So talk to me about that, uh, your educational background, and kind of how that leads into your, your work on this topic, because it's not just any old theological um, experience or perspective you have. It's kind of uniquely qualified to deal with this topic. Well, yes. As, as you mentioned, um, my degrees are all in religious studies or Theology, historical theology, so a BA from Yale, master and PhD from uh, from Emory, and <clears throat> my my focus then has been on the the history of theological development and discussion hmm. in the church, and that's so important for this subject because um, we are in a a period in history that's anomalous uh, with regard to this subject. We, for reasons historical reasons we can go into or not, um, in American culture in particular talking about the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence, of life on other planets that's intelligent, um, has been poo-pooed, has been mocked and derided, uh, considered a frivolous topic. But if you look back at the history of Christian thought, and especially Catholic thought, you find that the best minds of Catholic history have taken the topic very seriously yeah. and engaged in discussion. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you are... Um, <laughs> I, I think that it's like a common problem in today's world in like all areas of theology mm -hmm. is that people who aren't really trained theologians, who aren't necessarily trained in the mind of the church, who haven't spent decades forming their mind and their faith in line with the church, they, but they have a big mouthpiece. They got a big, you know, f you know social media following or mm -hmm. whatever. So, you know, I think that uh, particularly the topic of aliens, and I'm just going to say aliens for short, but I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll give you a chance to explain what's the difference and there's an alien and an ETI. But, um, but I think particularly for this subject, we needed somebody who's a bona fide thinker of the church, with the church, with the real credentials to kind of live, lend credence to this subject. It's a serious theological topic and ancient aliens TV show and all these kinds of things have kind of made it a joke. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, you have a book that's 500 footnotes in this thing, 500 footnotes. And uh, so it's just even that alone shows you this is a very serious topic. So, um, you know, you were reminding me earlier um, about how we agreed to, to write this book, but I thought that was a cool st story. So just, just mention that. Well, just briefly. First of all, it's a subject I've been in, interested in since my youth. And... Um, but something I, I was writing other books and doing other things, teaching college, so I didn't have time. But about eight years ago, when I was working as your editor here, I, uh, <clears throat> you and I were walking out on Myrtle Beach. We were having an editorial retreat there, looking at the stars, and something made me think about the subject. And I said, yo, Connor, I've always wanted to write a book on extraterrestrial intelligence and the Catholic faith. And you said to me, do it. I'll publish it. Yeah. Eight years ago, but yeah, why it takes so long? <laughs> <laughs> well, there wasn't time, and it was it was off this you know about on the back shelf for me, until the last few years, when beginning with a series of articles in the New York Times, um, and some <clears throat> information that was revealed through that, that the government uh, of the United States, despite all of its denials of such things, have uh, have had a an agency to study and identify the phenomena for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, former director of that kind of came out with this article in the New York Times, was interviewed, and began talking about what we do have and the th kind of things that are going on. After that, there were some, <clears throat> pardon me, there were some uh, videos that were released 
by naval by uh, yeah, the, the navy. Tic-tac, yeah, the tic tac yeah. stuff, all that kind of the thing. Nimitz, Nimitz. Uh, that was the that name was, of the aircraft. That was one of them. Yeah, there, there were several incidents actually, and in fact, in those you uh, you have witnesses saying, "Yeah, we've been seeing this every day for wow. months." <laughs> um, and so it kind of began to bring it to the attention of uh, not so much. I mean, the first one of the times articles came out at the height of the COVID panic and the um, the rioting and social unrest in uh, July of 2019. And so even though there was an article there that that said one of the experts who was giving closed testimony to Congress in a closed session was talking about retrieved crash materials from UFOs. Yeah, that's, yeah you passed that on to me, yeah. And no, it hardly made a ripple because everybody was looking at more terrestrial things at that time. Right, yeah. But anyway, I began to say, okay, it looks like things are going to finally change about the conversation. Yeah. We'll see it is serious. And for centuries, one of the things I'd seen was that, but I see it today too, that uh, a lot of folks will tell Christians and Catholics in particular uh, who are skeptics of religion, if there is such a thing as extraterrestrial intelligence, it disproves your faith. Yeah. And um, that's been going on at least since Thomas Paine, you know, the writer of the Age of Reason, time yeah. of the American Revolution. And then there are others who are more spiritually minded, but um, kind of you know, maybe from a New Age direction who claim that, yes, there are extraterrestrials and there are space brothers and they've come to reveal the true religion and your religion is false. So part of what I wanted to do is, you know, if this stuff begins to come out, Catholics need, I'm not, I'm not trying to prove one way or another UFOs, that's not what the book's about, right. but trying to help Catholics and other Christians understand this has been part of our conversation, right. historically for a long time, and the church, church can accommodate that discovery if we should find that out so, without compromising our, our traditional faith. Yeah, I think that's the main that's the main point of the book, right? So we're just yeah. kind of get the main point of the book yeah. is is that and I was going to ask you the question but you already said it, it's like can a a devout catholic uh even a, a traditional leaning catholic like mm-hmm. myself um can they believe in aliens? And uh well, let me just ask that. So how would, how do you answer that? As a as a devout Catholic, you're a man of the faith. You 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 don't want to think anything outside of the teachings of the Holy Mother Church. Um, you've spent decades defending the church, explaining the church, trying to live a holy life. You've, you've so that's what I meant earlier. Is like you got your your credentials here. Um, can and and there's a there is a a vein. In the traditional movement, Paul, that you, I'm sure you're more aware of than I am, that you, as a real Catholic, you can't believe in this stuff at all. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. how do you answer that and kind of tie that into the point of the whole book? Well, first of all, that um, the historical part of the book, which is the first first large section of it, uh, shows how very very faithful Catholics throughout the centuries, first of all, have discussed the subject. Some of them thought, well, I don't think they do exist. Um but others very faithful saying, yeah, of course, that's possible. Uh, so to show that it's our thinking these days is kind of contrary to the way the long conversation we've already had in the church. But also to what I do is to, to tackle in particular both scriptural texts and um, texts from magisterial documents that people have put out and said, see, this proves that there can't be. So, for instance, an old, an old argument and you see it in Protestant circles as well, that the Bible doesn't mention extraterrestrial intelligence, therefore it's contrary to our faith. Um, and, of course, the simple <laughs> reply to that is, well, you know, especially the book, book of Genesis. So someone, St. Augustine once said to people who thought that way, the book of Genesis doesn't talk about angels. Well, yeah. no, it doesn't. I mean, unless they're included in the heavenly bodies. But that doesn't mean that they don't exist. We yeah, know I, got a, I got a golden doodle and a Bernie doodle. I don't think those are in the Bible either. <laughs> well, so. dinosaurs, ductile platypuses, <laughs> <laughs> microbes, <laughs> um, I mean, all kinds of things, aren't, because the Bible's not intended right. you know, to right. be that kind of a book. Right. So, I mean, that's just the easiest you know, right. uh, thing to, to reply to. But um, to help folks to, to see that, yes, you can be a faithful Catholic and be open to these possibilities. I'm not saying absolutely it's true. We don't know yet. Uh, but just as the church was able to accommodate the so-called Copernican Revolution, mm-hmm. when the church, like everybody else, was was going by Aristotelian science, if you want to call it that, yep. that the Earth's at the center and there's only one universe and all that stuff, and so therefore it can't be. And some of the Christians who rejected it did so on the on the basis of Aristotle's thoughts. Yeah. Um, 
that yes, just if we we came to realize that scientific evidence shows us that's not true, we can accommodate that. Right. And the discovery of the new world. You know, if we there's a lot of things, a lot of questions that had to be asked about the status of these people. Are they completely human? Are they descendants of Adam? Yeah. If they are, can they be saved? If so, why hasn't God revealed to them? I think we're going to get into that <clears throat> because we talk about yep. like Augustine and others who talk about especially basically extraterrestrial to them, <clears throat> mm-hmm. and people maybe even on the other side of the ocean. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll get into that. But I, going back to kind of something you hinted a minute ago, um, another reason for this book is if the Pentagon dumps a whole bunch of information on us all of a sudden, and they've been putting some stuff out, mm-hmm. but if the little green guy, you know, landed his his saucer on the White House lawn and got out and walked in and said hi to Joe Biden uh, and they started talking, you know, um, well, poor Mr. Biden might not, might not know exactly what to say because he doesn't usually know what to say. But uh, the question I have is, do you think popularly that a lot of Catholics, Catholics would see that and say, well, then our Catholic faith must be fake. It must not be true. Christ must not be God. Redemption must not have happened. Genesis must not be true. So if we had a real, you know, irrefutable, mm-hmm. an irrefutable uh, evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, um, intelligence, I guess, being an operative word there, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, do you think that mass attendance would go down the next week? See, I don't think so. There are... Um Back in 1960, uh, NASA had um, had the the Brookings Institute um, do a report on kind of the future of NASA and what they could do with that information. And <clears throat> among other things, toward the end, they they said, "Well, if we ever have evidence of this, then the government and perhaps scientists will have to determine whether they should keep it secret or not." I mean, it's not mm. their exact words, but right. that's what the implication. And the reasoning was because they thought it could cause such social disruption to have that information. And the example they gave is the Spaniard conquistador is coming to Latin America and, and their society kind of falling apart because all of a sudden their whole worldview is falling apart. And that's probably been one of the excuses used uh, by government officials who do know, what's, you know what, what the government knows to, to keep it hidden. Um, and I do believe there's a lot that's been hidden. But... Uh, but I think even if that might have been the case, then it's certainly not the case. Now, the surveys that I've seen, sociological surveys of different religious groups and leaders, including Catholics, but also Protestants and other, other non-Christian religions, mostly the leaders, and I think people would take, you know, follow the leaders, but also the, the man in the pew say, no, <laughs> they yeah. wouldn't, change, wouldn't destroy my faith, wouldn't undermine it. But part of the reason of the book is that if people would have doubts, or even if they say, Okay, it doesn't destroy my faith, but how does it fit in how's with it? it? How's it reconcile? That's yeah. yeah. That's why the book's there yeah, to help them awesome. see at least the possibilities. I, I don't think I don't think people. I mean, maybe maybe at a different time in history, um, but I don't know if it's just that people have been softened with science fiction, Star Trek, Star mm-hmm. Wars, whatever. But I don't think people's faith would be shaken if they found out aliens existed. I mean, they. I think we're just all wondering it, and there's. For the few people who are kind of on the fringe, I guess, of saying, no way, you cannot believe this and be Catholic at the same time, I don't really care what they think. So, I mean, I, I, I think that the vast majority of people, this would not be a crisis of faith. But they would all say, but what do we do now? Like, what do we do with Mary? Exactly. Yeah. So, like, some of the questions we're going to get to is, like, you know, the hypostatic union, Jesus' relationship with extraterrestrials, could he have multiple natures? Um uh, could the Father or the Holy Spirit have been incarnated? That's a cool topic. We're going to talk about mediatric uh, of all graces. How's Mary playing to this? There's so many <laughs> amazing topics. And I think that, that your second part of your book is where you you do your theology work on, like, how does this stuff reconcile or how mm-hmm. what might an answer be? Um, the typical questions that people sitting around at night, Catholic theologians or quasi-theologians sit around and talk about, like, you, part two is where you take on those. The first part of the book, however, is that historical study of what have people said throughout, mm-hmm. you know, since B.C. And um, so we're going to get there. But um, 
I got to ask kind of early on in this discussion, do you personally believe in extraterrestrial intelligence? I think, I guess everybody could guess the answer, but then why don't you throw in there like, why? Like, why? I mean, you're a smart man. You're a thinker. You're not somebody who just vegges out and watches ancient aliens. You know, the guy with the pointy hair. Like, you don't, you know, you're not going to have your intellect shaped by National Geographic, okay, uh, or the History Channel. Like, do you believe in ETIs and why? I, <clears throat> one of the things I say in the book is that we have to have an attitude of humility in all this. And in some theologians, that's, that's terribly lacking, unfortunately, and some who aren't theologians but still commenting. Um, <clears throat> and so I say in the book, I'm, mostly I'm saying I'm dealing in probabilities mm -hmm. at most, really possibilities mostly, and then a few that I think are probable. There are a few things that you can say because of our faith that we know. So, for instance, if there is ETI, extraterrestrial intelligence, it was created by God, and it is under the lordship of God and of Christ. Um, and that God loves those creatures. He loves everything he made. So you've got things like that that I can say for sure. Uh, well, but I, hang on. Sorry, I'm sorry. So you said, but Christ. Yeah, and that's part of what we have to talk about. Yeah, because, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, you, you, know, you know why <laughs> yeah. I paused. So, yeah, yeah. Go take that. Yeah, because people would, would say, well, then, so that means then what Christ did here as affects other planets. Right. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that... Um, all that we have about salvation is applies to the human race with re regard to salvation, that God may have other ways to save other creatures who are not part of the race of Adam. <clears throat> but that if Christ, for instance, were incarnate on another planet, um, it would still be the same Son of God. Right. We're not talking about different lords, different saviors, different right. sons of God. It would all be the same person but taking to himself multiple natures. Yeah. And interesting enough, though St. Thomas Aquinas didn't didn't really speculate much about life on other planets, uh, he did address the question of whether the Son of God, the Word of God, could take on a second nature or more, not just one. And he said, well, he hasn't on Earth, but that he could. So, so, so did he say another? It wouldn't be another human nature. You can only have one human nature. So, it, what other kind of nature? When Thomas was speculating on that. An angel nature? Like, what else? No, what I think nature? by that what he meant is... Or, or did he mean, like, was he implying other intelligent life form out there? I think it was more like concrete nature, that if he had chosen, the Son of God could have been incarnate as a man twice. He would still be the same person, because Christ is only one, one, person, person, one person, divine person, who's been around from all eternity, but that he would have taken nature twice, numerically twice. Oh, okay, so yeah. taken on human nature twice. <clears throat> twice. But the principles, you know, are the same, that... Or he says, it's, yeah, it's the same Lord, the same. And um, and so if it's happened on another planet, using that principle, it's not like they're two Christ. Right. In right. the sense of two saviors, yeah. two lords. It's that this one son of God who's, you know, remember the person of the Holy Trinity yeah. from before all ages has taken that on. Yeah. And then the other part of that, again, you kind of get had to get deep into some of the theology, but the um, communicatio idiomatum, that's the principle that whatever you can say of one nature of Christ, you can say of the other because they are one person. Mm -hmm. So that's why we can say God died. He didn't die in his divine or, nature. Or Mary's the mother of God. Of God, exactly. Right. And that's how that whole doctrine was developed. People person. trying to say, no, she was only the, the mother of the man, Christ. Well, no, there was only one person. She didn't give birth to twins. She right. gave birth to one person who had a human and divine nature. So you can say God stumped his toe. Right. God, yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and you can say that Jesus of Nazareth worked a miracle. Yeah. Because it's all the same person. Can you so, say Jesus of Nazareth created the world? In the sense that um, they, the church does warn us that if, if you're using language that sounds like you're only talking about his human nature, then be careful. But you could certainly say you know, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is, is Lord of all and holds the universe together the same way St. Paul talks about it. So given that, um, anything that you could say of that one Son of God incarnate here could be said of that one Son of God incarnate somewhere else. Oh, okay. So that the same, if they say if he was incarnate somewhere else, you can say Jesus Christ is Lord of the universe because he is the Son of God who is right. the Lord of the universe. And if he's incarnate somewhere else, they could say of him in that incarnation, he's also Lord of the universe. And it's not an also, it's the same statement. 
because he is the same person. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So, so let me ask this: um, How you know we we I'm I'm kind of getting back to some of the preparatory stuff. We mm-hmm. we we already jumped into <coughs> yeah. some of the yeah. substantive theology stuff, which is all. It just happens. It just goes there. Um, have you been dismissed or mocked, or do you think some of your fellow theologians in the Catholic uh, marketing place or in the Catholic, you know, academia, you know, do you worry about some of them you know, thinking thinking poorly on you? Or do they think you're nuts? Do they think you're crazy? <laughs> and you, what was your level of concern about that going into this, and then how are you going to respond to that? Because you are going out on a limb, you yeah. know, being on yeah. this interview I mean, Tannen, I guess, I guess, is going out on a limb and publishing this book mm-hmm. and saying, okay, this is a legit topic, you know, and a lot of your colleagues might not think so. So, you know, have you had any backlash yet? And, uh, or if you do, what are you going to do about it? Well, I've, uh, the academic world in general, not just in theology, has scoffed at this. Scientists have found that. That's beginning to change in part because of the things I mentioned a while ago in the last couple of years. Yeah, the government's actually so, helping yeah. in this. Yes. Can you so, believe the government's helping something? <laughs> <laughs> they, they are. I mean, you got yeah. you got Tucker Carlson. That's not government's media, but you got Tucker Carlson. You got you got Avi Loeb, who's the the chair of the you know astronomy or astrophysics or the department at Harvard, who is now founded the Galileo Project to actually go looking for this stuff. And but same thing, he got that kind of attitude. So yeah, I even mentioned in the book. I was warned in the beginning, in academic circles, you'll probably look down on. Yeah. Um, it didn't bother me first, because, first of all, because um, looking at history, I said, this really is a legitimate discussion. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as I say in the intro, if you, uh, if you want to give me a tinfoil hat, okay, but you'll have to give one to St. Augustine and St. Thomas and Descartes and Plato and Aristotle and all these other guys. As that well. would have been I mean, awesome to have the image of the book, like have tinfoil hats on <laughs> Padre Pio and yeah. St. Jerome. Yeah. That would have been awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than the skull being on St. Jerome's desk, it could have had like a tinfoil hat, you know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's your point is like these, if you need a tinfoil <clears throat> hat, so do those guys. So, okay. You know, second, I'm getting older. <laughs> you know, I'm You're retired. Now. Who cares? <laughs> okay. I really, you know, it's that's not like awesome. I'm going to lose my job at a, at yeah. a college, on a college faculty or something. But, but third and most important, that because of things developing with government, what has been called a disclosure, yeah. Uh, they know a lot more than they're telling, yeah. uh, even with the congressional hearings this week. Um, it seems to be on a trajectory, the mixed metaphors of, of slow leak, yeah. more and more information. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they will allow scientists like the folks in the Galileo Project to be the first to say, we found evidence. <laughs> yeah. And then they wouldn't have to admit that they'd you know, hidden it. But um, but again, the book's not about UFOs, but I'm saying that and this cultural moment – in America especially, but it's also in Australia. One of the best books written on this is by this Ross Coulthard, one of the investigative journalists in Australia. has won all kinds of awards, and he has really done a lot of work here. But in this cultural moment, people are beginning to take it seriously again. And if it should be disclosed, then this is the time when we need a Catholic apologetics book. About yeah. Yeah, it's, it's I've, been, I've done apologetics for, you know, ever since I'm a convert, yeah. ever since I became Catholic, trying to help people understand who aren't Catholic, the Catholic faith and what it really does believe and what it allows for, and then helping Catholics understand their faith so that when people challenge them, they can say, no, this is what we believe, and here's why. So I see it as one more example of that, and I'm not, I'm not embarrassed by that. I'm yeah. not ashamed of that. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, all right, so getting back into part one of the book, right? It's the historical <clears throat> conversation. And you do. You start in ancient Greece, I think, mm-hmm. right? And so you go through. Give us, you know, so we're talking 25 centuries or so of Western civilization. Okay, okay. that's a lot of time. Um, who are some of the best-known historical figures that you kind of dove into? And you just you just probably did a sampling. I mean, you probably couldn't have done yeah. all of them. Yeah. But give us some of the big hitters. Give us some of the, the Hall of Famers that you refer to in this as people who have either posited, uh, or positively stated you know, or implied aliens are out there or at least said certainly they could be. Or even just in the conversation. You have some that just you know, concluded not, but when you look at the reasons they concluded not, it's because they were basing it not on 
really on scripture theology, the, the main characters that I'm looking at, but more on uh, Aristotle's science and philosophy. So the early conversation, the thing to understand about that is that um, when the Greeks used the word cosmos, where you get the word cosmic from, um, we can translate that world, it gets translated world in John, you know, the Gospel of John, that kind of thing, but can also mean universe. And they had the discussion they called the plurality of worlds, mm -hmm. plurality of the cosmoic, plural, um, and that could that be possible. Mm -hmm. And when they were talking about they they did not have in mind multiple planets in this in this cosmos, in the universe. They weren't even aware that planets were habitable places, you know. They looked more like stars in the sky in the beginning. But le yeah, but later on people really thought oh, certainly. people lived oh, on yeah. the moon. Oh, yeah, it was all over the place, yeah, 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 so, yeah. even yeah. on the sun. Um, so the first part of the discussion is about multiple universes. And uh, both Plato and Aristotle, who, you know, took this question very seriously, um, for different philosophical reasons thought that the most perfect world would be where you only have one universe. And for Aristotle, of course, the earth was at the center of it. Right. The different elements had different weights, and earth all went to the, the, the element of earth all went to the center. And so they just said, no, there can't be more than, more than one universe, one world, but what they meant was universe, but then wouldn't talk about... Okay, wait, so they would say, like a lot of the texts that are translated, they would say it can't be more than one world. Cosmos. Cosmos, but, and we translated it often as world, world but... They meant universe. But you think they meant universe. Oh, yeah, you could, it's clear from the discussion, because for okay. Aristotle, there's only one universe that exists. You can't have stuff outside of that. Okay, so they weren't the really Earth talking about to... planet Earth. They were talking about the universe. And they were discussing whether there could be multiple, multiple universes. universes. Which is interesting, because you had Democritus um, and and other pre-Socratics who said, sure, we can have more universes. I mean, people today talk about multiple universes. They don't realize 25 centuries ago, they were doing people something. were already thinking about that and talking about, it. could it be possible to have multiple yeah. universes? But the, now, would the, that be like at the same time, or is it like, could they be a universe before this one existed, this one ends, and, you know? Both, uh, yeah. both, yeah, at the same time. Yeah. So, but but they did so for their for philosophical and scientific reasons. So if you think that there are only four elements in existence, and they have different weights, and that the heaviest is Earth, and it all goes to the center of what exists and creates the Earth, that kind of thing, then you're going to rule out, you know, uh, multiple universes. However, interestingly enough... Um, you have Aristotle thinking that the that the the planets, or maybe it was Plato, one of them, thinking that the planets actually are moved by intelligences, or are intelligent themselves. That's even some early Christians thought that. So in a sense, they're really talking about ETI that when they say that that they think up there in the heavens, the things that we see move across the sky are actually alive. Wow. So in a sense, they're they're talking about they just don't get into the notion of ha inhabiting. Balls of rock. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, so that was going on the, the early, so several philosophers, Platonic, Aristotelian, and, and the others, the atomists, some of them were called. What about like the Egyptians and like the other side, like the East? You know, what were they doing with this stuff? I, I don't know because I had to narrow the book somehow. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. It got right. really long. Focus on so I didn't look at that. You certainly have all kinds of mythology among the Egyptians and others. Right. Creatures coming down from the sky and stuff in, like that. India, China. I bet you yeah. they have their whole... Same same thing as they were probably questioning this. Yeah, yeah, even probably before ancient Greece was. Oh yeah, especially in India, it's uh, yeah. So they. Um, but our, so our we, the, the West, you know, our Western Christianity largely relies on the ancient Greeks. They they drew so, out of yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, eventually, under the influence of Saint Augustine, you had a whole Platonic kind of stream mm -hmm. of of Catholic thought. And then Aquinas comes in centuries later and uh, kind of rediscovers in certain ways Aristotle and rehabilitates and has to correct them. You know, Aristotle thought the material universe had always existed, didn't have a beginning. Yeah, the medievals debated that, right? Mm -hmm. They really debated whether even the earth, I, I, and I read in graduate school in philosophy, you know, the, whether the earth was immortal. You know, that was one mm -hmm. of the debates, mm -hmm. you know, and. They could have been saying universe. I don't know. It could have been translated, and you know. Yeah, if they were saying way. world, then maybe that's right. what. Yeah. But that that was they were trying to figure that out. Was this stuff always here? You know. Yeah, and of course, because the Genesis account right. it's ex nihilo out of out of nothing, then that's one of the ways that Aristotle had to be corrected in his you know his, his science, so to speak, 
um, by Aquinas and others. But for the first, those first few centuries, most of the Christian theologians, if they got into an area that wasn't just strictly theology but involves some, the kind of science of the day and philosophy, they tended to fall into one of those two camps. And, and both of those camps had this notion philosophically that if you have kind of one source for, for Plato, it was called the Demiurge, who creates right, yeah. out of all this yeah. stuff, or Aristotle, the, I guess the... the, the uh, prime mover. Prime mover, right. Yeah. That, that it's only fitting if you only have one prime mover or one Demiurge that you only have one universe. Mm -hmm. Now, if we call that and say, well, it doesn't necessarily follow to me, (laughs) but within their system, that's how it was. And they were so influential that way that they tended to, uh, early church fathers tended to kind of come under that that understanding. So what happened in the Middle Ages where you began to finally have people say, well, you know, Aristotle's good on a lot of things, but there's some things that aren't. So, for instance, um, you had some theologians say, no, God could not have created could not have created multiple universes, yeah, that's multiple a worlds. Yeah. So, and and they would say, was, there was were they talk. arguing as like a contradiction of his nature? Like we say, you can't, he can't make a weight, so heavy can't pick up, right? We all know that. Well, not really. They were it was arguing more according to Aristotle's science, kind of the that, and but the philosophy too, the the notion that it's it's more perfect to have only one thing right. okay. by one creator. Right. Now, I look at that and say, that's not obvious to me at all, <laughs> you right. know, not to me. because you have the, the, the principle of plenitude, as it's been called, that, no, it makes more sense that a creator like ours expresses his, and, and even Thomas hinted at this, expresses his perfections by the diversity of right. what Right, we does got, I mean, he the fills plenitude. the world with exactly. stuff. I mean, microscopically, yeah. we got stuff all over us. Yeah. God makes things and fills up, fills up every square inch, seemingly, you yeah. know. And, 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 again, Aquinas himself talked about that, that he shows... Each thing shows for some reflects some part of his perfection, but since no one thing can show all of his perfection, he makes lots of things. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So you have that that coming up uh, in the Middle Ages, and but anyway, by the time the the new universities, you know, Paris and others, um, had begun adopting largely this notion that God could not have made more than one universe just because of what's fitting and perfect. Um, uh, a man named Etienne, who is the Bishop of Paris, comes out with a very clear document saying. Here are things that are being taught in the universities that are contrary to the faith. And one of them was the statement that God cannot make. Yeah. More than one girl. God is all powerful. So that he was can the statement. Yeah, he can. Yeah. 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 And immediately all had to kind of rush and say, okay, well, he could, but he hasn't. <laughs> well, why not? But um, so. And this is a bishop of Paris in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Probably yeah. going around where the University of Paris was the big deal. That's right. where Aquinas yeah, that's, that's and where Bonaventure was, exactly. and all the bigwigs yeah. went there. And it was the bishop of this. So this is these are heavy hitters saying God can do this if he wants. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then even St. John Chrysostom, where the church father said that he concluded that there was only one, probably under the influence of Plato, I'm going to guess. But uh, but he said, of course he can make multiple mm-hmm. universes. He can do yeah. anything. Yeah. Said, it's, it's easier for him to make them than it is for you to think of them, he said. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so slowly there began to be an opening up. And as Aristotle's science and philosophy was challenged in certain ways, um, what happened was was people began thinking, well, yeah, maybe there could be more of this. And you finally get voices like uh, Nicholas of Cusa, who was a cardinal yeah. uh, involved in one of the uh, you know, councils, uh, who began to really clearly say, of course he can, and, and kind of lay out the stuff. Um, so but how does that tie into alien? So that's just for our listeners. So you got multiple universes. Oh, so someone like Cusa came right out and said, yeah, and I think they're all inhabited. If there are multiple ones, they're inhabited. Inhabited, yeah. Inhabited, and can even have different natures yeah, according to where they are. Yeah, what's the point of making a universe if there's no one in there? <laughs> you know, kind of a lonely place, yeah. So it took time. Um, but then, again, with uh, with Galileo and the development of the, the telescope, um, it began to be clear, first of all, that, yes, Earth is not the center of the universe and that there are other stars out there. And, they, and though there was, we, we have only seen, for sure, exoplanets, planets of other star systems, that only began to happen in the 1990s um, you know, with very advanced scientific methods. But they're going to speculate, yeah, if our, if our star, the sun, has planets, they probably do too, and sure it makes sense to have them. And so you have um, all kinds of people throwing out all ideas about it, uh, Most of, a lot of them Christians, some of them with weird ideas, of course. There, there's one, one guy who concluded, he wasn't Catholic, but concluded that um, – that hell is in the sun, <laughs> so if you go to hell, you're gonna live. You know, you live in the sun for eternity. But and there are lots of other wild ones. 
But by the by the 1800s, by the 19th century, basically across the board, all the Christians said, sure, not all of them, but almost all of them. So that, for instance, St. St. John Newman, you know, from, from late some very strong quotes from him. Yeah, where he's, I mean, now he's he's not so sure about it, but he makes the point that's very important here that it was so there was so much of a near consensus that it did exist and that God did create it in England and by extension, you know, the, the Anglosphere of America, that he said people were acting like it would be a blasphemy to deny it. Right. Right. And so that gives you an idea of whatever he thought. Uh, so that it that was, was not the, like was it is quote today. I was with, look for. with people saying, no, yeah. of course it can't be. No, they were saying, what do you mean it can't be? Yeah. It's, of course it is. Yeah, I wish I could find that quote in here. <clears throat> this is the, the draft of the book, but it was a powerful quote about you know, blasphemy to to think that it was impossible, if I recall. Yeah. Or and he, well, basically what he was saying was was that there's such a consensus among the, the academic world and the theological world everywhere is that if you should be, question it, they say blasphemy. Right. So the point there is is not whether he believed it or not, but he, right. the point was just that that's the consensus and well, so different from now. Yeah. 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 So so let's go back to the a little bit earlier. Tell us the all right, so we've, we, you've talked about how this was serious business for a long time. A lot of people took these questions very seriously. Let's, maybe it's a good time to jump into some specifics, like St. Jerome, <laughs> one of my favorite. We got a skull right over there. And yeah, he, the always, he always had one uh, on his desk. But, you know, this is the guy who, you know, gave us the Latin Vulgate, Right, um, you know, he he was the first, didn't he? And he's the first first one to put scripture into into Latin. Is that well, right? So there were portions before, but he was the first to give us the the whole thing that, in some form or another, served the church until right. recent times. Yeah. A doctor of the church, doctor of the church, right? I father mean, of the church. I mean, the father of biblical scholarship. Yeah, probably the best catechized, one of the best, like along with Augustine, he was a contemporary of his day. Knew scripture better than probably anybody, anybody. in his day. Yeah. yeah. So he's got a story. Yeah, it's and this amazing. is this is one of my favorite parts of the whole book. But you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, of you you, you got to tell us a story. So he writes in a letter. Uh, he's writing well, well, as part of the a life of Saint Anthony the Great, and how Saint Anthony, who of course lived out in the desert, he's one of the founders of the monastic movement, the ascetic movement. I think it was the life of Saint Paul. I'm sorry, life of Saint Paul. Yeah, but he was not talking Paul, about Saint not Anthony. Paul with the Corinthians, right? It was. Oh no, so no our yes. friends don't know. Right, so the two great kind of desert founders followers. of the desert movement, f- right. found, yeah, movement, were Saint Paul and another Saint Paul and Saint Anthony. Yeah, so, they say Paul of the desert, right? Yeah, That's how yeah, people or, think about it. yeah, Paul the hermit or something like that. Yep. Yeah. And so Anthony was going to visit Paul. So I'm sorry. Yes, it is the life. And of Saint that's why, yeah, famous famous story. stories about how. Anthony was out there always alone, but a few times he went to visit Paul. Paul right? Yeah, to kind of compare notes about how things. I were actually going. have in my office at home. I have a uh, a painting of the two of them meeting uh, because well, yeah. when he did finally meet Paul, well, I think Paul was he was dead and and frozen in prayer. Like he was, he prayed so mm-hmm. much he died in a, a prayer position. But this story is about his journey, how Saint Anthony right. of the desert went to see St. Paul. Is that right? Right. Okay, go ahead, sorry. And so he tells how he meets first a centaur. And what is that? What is that? That's a Greek mythological figure, um, half man, half horse. We've all seen pictures. Yeah. And then a satyr after that, a centaur left, and a satyr showed up, who's kind of like part man, part goat, I guess you could say. (laughs) And you actually, in some translations of the Bible, there satyrs show up. So you have to wonder, okay, what exactly it means? Really? Does it, does it just mean, yeah, yeah? Does it just mean a hairy creature? The Hebrew could mean that, but in the Old Testament, there, there's reference to Saturn. Um, so the what happens is he he I focus on the second part where because uh, it seems like maybe there's a little contention with the centaur, but with the satyr, the satyr comes to him. And I'm paraphrasing, but. And basically, yeah, I don't think he put the centaur in here. No, I didn't even mention him because it, yeah, it's not, that was news to me. Doesn't okay. go to my point. Yeah, right, it doesn't right. go to my okay. point. Um, because it was the satyr that actually had the interesting exchange yeah. with him, in right. which um, he, you know, wants to know what he is, and he says, "I'm a satyr. I'm, I'm a, of that race that the Gentiles have, have wrongly worshipped, and that kind of thing." And we've heard that the Son of God has come to you, and we want you to pray for us to him. And now, again, I'm paraphrasing, but. Um, and then in, in there, St. Anthony 
begins to weep in the story because he knows how in the great city of Alexandria, which is so worldly, that's why those guys left it they, in the first that's place. That's why they left, yeah. <clears throat> that there were all these Christians who could care nothing about Christ, and here's a pagan satyr who wants, he wants access to, to Christ. Christ. Yeah. yeah, and he begins to weep, and he says that. So after that, you could say, okay, well, St. Jerome didn't really believe that. He's just reporting the story the way he heard. But then St. Jerome goes on to say, and for those of you who don't think there are such things. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I got the passage here. Oh, you want to read it? Yeah, yeah. I do. So <clears throat> he says, this is St. Jerome talking, mm -hmm. right? And so let no one scruple to believe this incident. Its truth is supported by what took place when the Emperor Constantine was on the throne only 40-some-odd years ago, about the time Jerome was born, a matter of which the whole world was witness. For a man of that kind was brought alive, meaning the, 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 the satyr, <laughs> was brought alive to Alexandria and was shown as a wonderful sight to the people. Afterwards, his lifeless body to prevent its decay through the summer heat, was preserved in salt and brought to Antioch that the emperor might see it. <laughs> so, so this is some this just is, legend. Yeah. I mean, this is within his own lifetime. This is St. Jerome, yeah. Jerome saying, saying this. if you don't believe exactly. this story about St. Anthony of the desert going to see St. Paul, <laughs> then you got to believe this. And he t So was St. Jerome, where's his tenfold hat? Right. Exactly. So what's and, he? So what's? And people will say, okay, he's not talking about ETI. He's talking about right. what in today's parlance we call ultra terrestrial. Right. The notion that you could actually have intelligent life on the Earth that's not human. Right. So that's why we didn't us. really explain how this connects. Yes. But I mean, but if the you reason can... I give that story yeah. is to say that uh, for those who would say that a faithful Catholic cannot even allow for the possibility of non-human intelligence besides angels. Right. That it's just us and angels and God, then. What, why would, you know, Jerome knows as well as anybody. Well, and the, your point also is not that the satyr actually existed. I mean, that could, have been, he, that could have been a forgery. Yeah, like, could people could have messed with people. But your point but, is, but Jerome believed it. He didn't object on the grounds of Scripture or tradition or anything else. I mean, maybe yeah. it was a forge. Maybe there was somebody, a wax museum yeah. kind of thing of the ancient world. And I say world. that. I'm not saying that, that I'm trying to argue for satyrs. Right. I'm trying to argue that here's one of the best... Catholic scholars we've got and theologians and father of biblical scholarship yeah. who had no problems imagining that there could be such a thing and right. that it would not contradict his faith. Right. Yeah, that's to me that's a very convincing mm. point there. And because if there was that, you know, non-human intelligence, even one seeking, you know, Christianity— you know, that's the first part of the story mm -hmm. is he wants, he says, the, the beast speaks of Christ, you know. You know, my dog isn't asking to learn about <laughs> Christ. You know, my goats aren't asking, you know, to, about Christ. But, you know, Jerome, a doctor of the church, really believed in this fictional, or we don't know, but this creature that was not fully human seeking <clears throat> conversion, essentially. So uh, whether or not it happened it shows the mind of St. Jerome, yeah. and that's a powerful yeah. thing. And you got many of these kinds of things in here. Let's talk about Augustine mm -hmm. and the ocean and, <clears throat> you know, the son of Adam and let her rip. There was a, a kind of, I guess you could call it a legend or rumor, maybe you well, would rumor in Augustine's time that contrary to popular belief today, most ancients in that that part of the world did not think the earth was flat. They thought it was spherical. They knew it was spherical. Um, you know, there was a an ancient Greek, yeah. Greek, ancient Greek who, who actually figured out the figured circumference, out the circumference yeah. of it. Um, and and but anyway, there was a rumor, a legend that on the other side there were men who lived. You know, the human humans who lived and walked around, and they were called the antipodes, which means feet. Opposite. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a colorful way to describe it, that if we're on the globe and your feet are going down this way, and these people on the other side, their feet are going the opposite way from yours. Uh, they're pointing in toward the center of the earth. Yeah. Um, and someone had, somehow it came up in, in, uh, in Augustine's writing. And <clears throat> he objected to the notion, and people after that have said, see, St. Augustine was talking about non-human intelligence, and he rejected the notion. Hmm. 
But that's not the case at all. He rejected the notion um, on two grounds to combine. One is that um, he, he believed, as the church has consistently taught, that all human beings are, are descended from a single pair of first parents, Adam and Eve, and, uh, and that through Adam they've, they've all fallen. So <clears throat> he thought, first of all, um, there can't be humans on the other side of the world who aren't descended from Adam. The whole human race is descended from Adam. So, you know, you might want to say, well, well, St. Augustine, couldn't they just travel there, as we know now they have? But the science of his day and the technology of his day would not allow that. They didn't know about the land bridge, you know, between old and and new worlds. And they certainly had no ships they were aware of that could sail. And that's the way he put it. He said that, you know, our land is surrounded by this immense ocean. There's no way somebody descended from Adam from our part of the world could get over all all the way under there. That's why they can't exist. It wasn't because he was saying there can't be non-human intelligence. He was just saying there can't be humans descended from Adam on the other side of the world, or who are not descended from Adam on the other side of the world. Yeah. And yeah, uh, awesome. that came up again with Pope, Pope Zachary. There was a priest who seemed to be, Virgilia seemed to be um, teaching that, but we still don't know for sure. All right, so we've talked about kind of the ancients. Mm-hmm. We've talked about some of the early church fathers, East and West. Jerome is one of my favorites, Augustine. You know, but let's talk a little bit about the the guys in the Middle Ages. You know, who were some of those theologians that kind mm-hmm. of dealt with some of these issues? And you were mentioning earlier how they were very much under the influence of the Aristotelian scientific mm-hmm. framework. Mm-hmm. But, you know, within that, you know, tell us a little bit about some guys in the Middle Ages. Yeah, so St. Albert the Great. You know, he's one of my he's, favorites. Oh, yeah. The, my, he's part of the dedication of my book, or he um, he's a patron of scientists and philosophers. And he which, was, he's Aquinas's. Uh, yeah, teacher. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and he have a you know a nice quote from him in there where he's just saying, "It's a marvelous question to think about whether there's more than one world." You see, and so like he was called the last man who knew everything. Okay, and <laughs> yes. it's because you know it was in a sense he sort of did know everything because at the time there weren't as many books just, to read, no. mm-hmm. and he had read everything, but he knew the philosophy, the theology, the science. Like these guys were. They, they they understood all the subject matters, right? We don't we have these specialists now, right? But he he knew everything, and so for him to state this, you know, is is a remarkable thing. He's a holy man who's one of the most educated people to ever walk the earth, and Aquinas's personal teacher, who predicted, by the way, that you know this dumb ox will bellow so loud that's right. that he'll shake the world, and that's <laughs> yeah. why he got the name dumb. Ox, or the kids were making fun of Aquinas and calling him a dumb ox, and. Albert the Great said, well, that dumb ox is going to bellow so loud it'll shake the world or something yeah, like that. Yeah, follow, follow the world here. Yeah. So, you know, so for, again, Albert the Great, this is not some chump theologian, you know, this is a serious guy. And so um, so he, just restate, he said that it, it's a great subject to think about, which yeah, indicates and he, what. I think finally he, you know, he concluded that, yeah, I don't think it's hap- happened that he's created more, again, under the in- you know influence of the ancient think, uh, Greek thinkers. But he but, was open to it. But the point is, he didn't say, this is stupid, you need a tinfoil hat. Right, right. <laughs> you know, he right. said, th- th- this whole, just the possibility of it was such a marvelous thing. Yeah. What could be more noble than to ask that question? Yeah. You know? And uh, so you have him, you have, what we've already mentioned, Aquinas, who contributes uh, some really important yeah, if Somebody pin you down discussion. and say, what's Aquinas' view on aliens? Like, how do you answer that in kind of a nutshell? I would say that Aquinas said uh, that Aquinas, under the influence of Aristotle's science and philosophy, thought that though, yes, God could create multiple universes and worlds that he had not, that it's more perfect this way, it's more fitting this way just to have one. But it's still under but the That's the number of, the of universes. The that's not about like extraterrestrial. Yeah, it's not about universe. inhabited planets. And right. he, so there's nothing, we can't conclude anything about what he would well, have Well, except that he also um, seemed at least open to the idea that um, the planets were, were animated, had, had mm, souls. Animated. So that's basically extraterrestrial intelligence. That right. would be living creatures, he, intelligent creatures beyond the Earth. But did he talk about something in my memory is telling me that did he talk <clears throat> about the the effects of Jesus Christ's the redemption on anybody else? Did he get into the cosmic Christ at all? Maybe not. Not that I recall. Yeah. He um, uh, the other place where his thought comes to bear here is where he he made the point that. Uh, you know, when the question was, could could the Son of God, the Word of God, be incarnate more than once? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we talked and about And he earlier. said, he said, uh, 
It could. Sure, he could. It could yeah, yeah, God could do that. He could right. choose to do that. He could have two numerically different natures, right. That's what was, but he's yeah. the same son of God. And, um, but he hasn't on planet Earth. Right. You know, he I mean, he didn't use the words planet Earth, but he hasn't um, among humankind. And so that leaves the principle, he's not even talking about life on other planets, but it leaves the principle that, and I, and I agree with it, that yes, the same son of God from all eternity who assumed to himself um, a human nature could also assume a different nature. Yeah, yeah. What about, um, it, well, anybody else you mentioned, Nicholas Well, when you get, yeah, yeah, 14th century and on uh, Nicholas of Cusa, who's, you know, <laughs> very important philosopher of the period and maybe controversial in some ways, but um, involved with an ecumenical council and, and other things, very well respected in the church. And, um, yeah, he was the first to really get into thinking about on other planets, you know, yeah. or, I mean, if there are other planets, so they, they would be inhabited and, and different from us. Yeah. Okay, so, so he was getting a little bit more specific. Yeah, he was. And so were others of his time. Uh, William, um, it's hard to remember all the names. I know. So. It's hard to remember all the names because I didn't know a lot of them before I did the Well, book. they're in the book. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. They're, all, they're in this book. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. that it was during that period then, really, the um, 14th century and on, that people began to kind of break out of the Aristotelian thing and right. say, no, it's... Because the principal plenitude, God could could make other universes, and they'd show different parts of his power and his might and his, his love and his wisdom. And so if they are, why wouldn't there be so I'm gonna intelligent races? So I'm going to skate on thin ice. I'm going to do a little dangerous thing here. But um, it did seem like there was a, a lot of citations to Protestant thinkers. You know, after the Reformation, you got mm-hmm. Protestant thinkers, a mm-hmm. lot of Protestant thinkers. Mm-hmm. Is it? I'm speculating here, but um, I mean, and your again, your point is never to show that anybody's particular belief is is right or wrong. It's to show that serious thinkers have taken the issue seriously, right? It's and that, it, and, and, and also it to show contra- that, to let contra- them throw out the ideas. Now, there are certainly people in there that I quote, and I make usually make it clear that that this particular thinker is contrary to Catholic faith, right? But, right. But so you have, you know. Um, Smith, Joseph Smith, the founder of the, the, the Mormon right. group, and, you know, and others. I'm not even thinking about guys like him, you know. Okay. I, I guess or even like Melanchthon, who, you know, was uh, right right under Luther there, kind of mm-hmm. a disciple by Luther, and mm-hmm. just absolutely can't, cannot be. So what, I, what I'm trying to do is say, okay, you have all these different ideas, and you have um, things thrown out. You have one, one kind of way out thinker who says, um, and, and it was a popular notion that, the purgatory was on the moon when they could see the moon was so desolate and that kind of thing that hmm. that's where souls will go. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, you know, that, that doesn't teach that. Um, other kinds of things. Somebody thought that hell was, was in the sun. Um, so uh, the point I'm just making is that I, I, I cited folks, I always, if they weren't Catholic, I always said so, yeah. and what their background was, uh, to help, help the reader to see all these ideas being thrown out, the clash of ideas, you know, um, how the conversation was developing. But I mean, were historically were Protestants more open <clears throat> to this idea than Catholic thinkers? It just depended. So Melanchthon, who's I mean, he's really critical to Lutheran history, absolutely against it. What's the, the name word? you're saying? Melanchthon, M E L A N C H T H O N. Melanchthon, and he was Luther's number two guy. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. So uh, Melanchthon was definitely against it. There were Calvinists against it. There were some Anglicans, but then you. Is that because they were more just bit like sola scriptura? Typically, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was that was one reason, but also wh- one of the problems, one of the issues that comes up is that you know Scripture does make it clear, and, and Catholic faith too, that God has a special relationship with the human race. Yeah, you know, and he, he died for us, and uh, and a lot of folks took this to mean that okay, if there are other intelligent races, that diminishes our standing before God, and therefore mm. it's contrary to Scripture. And well, well, okay. if, if your existence on the other side of the table <clears throat> doesn't diminish my relationship with my God, why would aliens diminish our relationship exactly. with our God? I, I love the saying of I mean, if that's the case, then I should not have more than one child. Exactly. I mean, this, the, I made yeah. the case in there. St. Augustine once said that God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. Yeah. He can have... He's infinite. This and is then easy. I, I say, if you're a parent, you know exactly what he's talking about. Oh, yeah. About. That's good. You know, I have a friend who says... You know, to each of his kids, I, I love you best. But he says it to yeah. all of each of yeah. them. And we all know that it, it doesn't diminish yeah. your love for any one of them to have more. 
Yeah. So that that whole notion just you know to me does a whole water. Yeah, right. But there have been a lot of folks who've thought of that that takes away from human dignity somehow. Right. Um, but you did have <clears throat> you know other Protestants who were on board with it, and you um, you know people like Isaac Newton, <laughs> uh, people like Kepler, Johannes Kepler, um, all kinds of folks that that weren't weren't Catholic but were yeah of course yeah let's speculate about it yeah. All right, let's come up to uh, more um, modern saints. You know, Padre Pio is a big one. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Monsignor Corrado Balducci, uh, an Italian uh, Monsignor who was uh, also an exorcist. And uh, By the way, we're going to talk about exorcisms in a minute. So, we're going to get to the demonic. Yeah. And that's really kind of my next line yeah. of thought. But go ahead. Sorry, Padre Pio. So, I'm just saying he... So anyway, he's he's the person who um, kind of brought this information to attention. I was not able to find the original source he's quoting simply because it's in, ta- in Italian and kind of hidden away in that order's um, archives, apparently. But he reports uh, a conversation that was was written down um, where someone asked Padre Pio, what about the aliens? I mean, we could read it from the book if you want. I'm paraphrasing. And basically he says, of course. Of course they're there. You think God's glory is only on this planet. And he even goes on to say um, that there are aliens who are unfallen. Was this based on a vision? Was this a mystical thing See, for that's him? See, that's the question I raise, is that um, the question is, was he stating an opinion? If so, why did he state it so matter of fact? He didn't just say, like, I think or I believe. He said, of course it is. <laughs> this way is very definite. So did he, was that, was an opinion he came to or... There's so many things that Padre Pio knew that he couldn't know in a natural way that he knew because of gifts, you know, the God would give him gifts of knowledge. Could that have been the result of a private revelation? Of course, I don't try to answer that. I can't. But it's very interesting that of all people, that someone who could know things happening at a distance, he had hidden knowledge of people's souls, he had all kinds of things, that he would make that kind of statement so emphatically. I got it. You, you got it? it? Yeah. The following dialogue is documented and officially published by the caption order. Question. Father Pio, some claim that there are creatures of God on other planets too. Answer. What else? Do you think they don't exist and that God's omnipotence is limited to this small planet Earth? What else? Do you think there are no other beings who love the Lord? Another question. Father, I think the Earth is nothing compared to other planets and stars. Answer, exactly yes, and we earthlings are nothing too. The Lord certainly did not limit his glory to this small planet. On other planets, other beings exist who did not sin and fall as we did. That's powerful stuff. That's Padre Pio, right? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Tan publishes like four books <clears throat> on Padre Pio. <laughs> you know, I mean, so what do you do with that? You know? Well, you've got that. You've got St. John Paul II. Well, I was going to get yeah. there. You're jumping ahead. So, I mean, so Pio... <clears throat> So the question is, is, you know, was that theological speculation on his part, or was that part of his mystical experience? And we won't, we just yeah, don't know. We don't know, right? But but that's it, a powerful statement. And I would think, like, when you go through your canonization process, if you're a nut job, then you wouldn't be canonized. So, <laughs> you know, that's that's pretty powerful stuff. Well, as in the case of Saint Jerome, I don't quote this to say Padre Pio said it, so it's got to be true. You know, it's, saints aren't infallible. But I am saying that someone who knew the faith as well as he did, who's as close to God as he is, right. a man of that kind of life and faith, saw no problem at all. Yeah. Was apparently convinced. Now, John Paul II, you mentioned him, so go ahead. And then I'm going to get to C.S. Lewis, so, but, but, <laughs> okay. uh, which we could talk for another hour about C.S. Oh, Lewis. My. Yeah. But, but John Paul II, why don't you tell people what he said to that little kid? Yeah, there was a, a, an, an audience um, that was, it was not his general audience at the Vatican, but it was in some church in Rome. It's all in the book. I can't remember all the details, but where uh, he's taking questions from the audience. A little girl says, you know, what, what about the aliens or what about... I, the, I bet her mom was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, can right. you imagine if little Paul Thickpen's kids are there, <laughs> yeah, Connor's right. little kids are with John Paul too, and they get to an- ask the ask Pope him, any a question, question, question right. yeah, and they ask, they ask about aliens. About aliens. Can, aliens. can you imagine those parents? <laughs> but the, the response is very suggestive, you know. He doesn't say, well, we don't know. Yeah. He doesn't say definitely not. He doesn't even say if they are, so and so. He just states simply, they are God's children too. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. He doesn't make it conditional. He doesn't. He certainly doesn't deny it. That's that's very suggestive. That's awesome. <laughs> He's a very clear thinker. He knew what he was saying. You know, he he understood his words very carefully. Yeah. yeah. And also, I have to mention Blessed Ann Catherine Emmerich. Oh yeah. The mystic. Yeah. Oh yeah. The Tan who, Publisher. Yeah. We got, yeah. We got our books you know, all over. We got. We got and Catherine Emmett right here. You know. Now, you know, her writings has been disputed about how much her um, uh, her editor and spiritual director might have changed or added to it, that kind of thing. And sure. so in her canonization process, they specifically said we're not going to use these writings, to, that they're not, you know, it's not any kind of rubber, um, approval of the writings. So again, my point in what she says is not that this proves it somehow, but she, she reported having visions of life beyond the earth and all, several things. Um, and on the moon, which you know we could be pretty sure wasn't true, but at least literally true. Um, but for 50 years after those things were published, the whole thing was endorsed by all kinds of prominent theologians saying there's nothing here contrary to faith or right. morals. Right. It's not so, contrary to faith. That's the thing. Right. And that's right? the point. So, so you get like I'm not a... claiming when somebody says this, that, see, that proves that it's true. I'm saying that proves that you can be a faithful Catholic and right. all these things and believe and know as well as St. Jerome did and others and, and allow for it, the possibility. And right. it, would not, it would not upset our faith. Well, that's yeah. the thing is like, and I think Ann Catherine Emmerich is a good <coughs> example here, okay? I mean, we don't have to believe in private revelation. Yeah. And some of her stuff's weird, right? Yeah. But we love it. I mean, it's, it's great stuff. It's, you can use it and weave it into your own spiritual life and your understanding of Christ. I mean, you're working on another book for us now. I'll just mention um, a life of St. Joseph as seen by the mystics. Because mm-hmm. we have a life of Mary as seen by the mystics, and the mystics talked about Joseph. We don't have to believe any of that stuff when it's private revelation, but it's it's glorious to incorporate into your faith, yeah. you know? And it's not contrary to the faith. That's the thing. It's like, you know, it's not against the faith to speculate about these things or have a personal prayerful experience that gives you something. So, I mean, if Anne Catherine Emmerich was having visions, who knows how much of it was self-induced or from from God. Or did the editor added or changed? I mean, the editor, yeah. We don't know. But it's not against the faith to hold those things, right? Uh, did I get according that according right? to all, According to all the theologians who for half a century afterward read it and endorsed it. Yeah. Not contrary to faith right. morals. So right. that's just the point of it, is that yeah. it's, uh, you can't just rule it out and say right. contrary to the faith. Right, um, right, which is too easily done, you yeah. know. So yeah. you want to talk about C.S. Lewis? I yeah. mean, you know, he's like your guy, you <laughs> yeah. know. And, you know, we could – and you got to be careful here because he's a science fiction writer too, right? So it's kind of like is his, is his view on these subjects trivialized or cheapened because he wrote uh, the – what, what do you call it? Um, you know, his the space, space, space trilogy. His trilogy right. mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, is this just, uh, you know, is he just practicing science fiction when he speculates on these things? You know, how do you how do you handle C.S. Lewis? I mean, who's, you know, a great thinker, and Catholics use him all the time. And, yeah. a whole, you know, a, a faithful Christian with a very keen mind, and the vast, vast majority of his works would fit perfectly with, Catholic thought. I think yeah. that's fair to say. And he's very Catholic in his thinking. He, very Catholic. He helped me to become Catholic. But I'm, you know, I'm a convert. And uh, I'd like to say he sacramentalized my imagination. Oh, <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Uh, just uh, in part through his fiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he's as, you know, he's as close as you get and, 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 a, be- <coughs> and a better thinker than, than most Catholics would ever be. I mean, he's mm-hmm. a, a remarkable person. But how do you handle, you know, talk about him and ETI? Well, he, he probably wrote more about it than any other 20th century Christian theologian. I'll, I'll call him a theologian. People, sure. you know, at Yale. No, I understand. He when didn't I studied have a PhD, at Yale, they would yeah. jokingly say, well, <laughs> armchair theologian, because he was in, uh, uh, in medieval literature, you know. Um, but as uh, I actually studied with Dr. Paul Homer at Yale when I was an undergrad there, who had been one of his disciples mm. at Oxford. And, um, and he talked about, you know, he just laughed about that and how, Lewis did better theology than so many of the theologians, in part because he kind of had a you know clinical distance on a lot. Yeah, of things. sort of like Chesterton. Yeah, same thing. He was a know. journalist. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was so widely read. He was such a clear thinker. He had such a rich imagination that he could imagine possibilities that other people didn't, and that's a big part of what he does here. So he wrote um, two essays. There were in particular. There's some other stuff that were nonfiction, in which he talks, kind of lays out 
the question, some of the major questions and, and the possibilities he thinks for answering those. But it's as if his, his um, space trilogy kind of gives, illustrates those in a fictional yeah. way, the possibilities. Yeah. So, for instance, for him, I don't want to give away too much for our, our listeners who may not have read his books yet, those books. Uh, one of the possibilities he throws out is that there could, what if there were a race that never did fall? that they were tested and they passed the test, the first parents, and then the whole race is confirmed like the angels. And in one of his books... Was that Palandria? Paralandria. Uh Paralandria. Yeah, Paralandria. So, um, and of course the ironic twist of that is that the temptation of of the mother of the race, kind of like parallel to our temptation of Eve, Mm -hmm. is accomplished by a demon-possessed human. Oh, wow. (laughs) Who comes from Earth there. (laughs) Way to go, humans. I mean, really, really. But I haven't end. read. I have not read. <clears throat> okay. I haven't read the space trilogy, and a friend of mine gave it to me recently. I, I gotta, I gotta read it. Oh, you got to. And you know, I'm, I'm going to the beach next week. Okay. Maybe, maybe, okay. maybe I'm gonna take C.S. Lewis. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. And see, and one of the other possibilities is, is that you know, if if there is this kind of, if the, the incarnations consequences spill over from Earth to other places, here's one way it could happen, and and that is that. Uh, a human being who's been redeemed on Earth and one who has not end up, I'll go ahead and say it, it's on Venus. Of course, we know it's not inhabited this way, but anyway. And the bad guy that Stephen possesses tempting her, but the good guy is the one who helps her to resist the temptation. And so in that case, what has gone on on Earth, his redemption came about through Christ, is now having effects on Venus. Wow. So it's kind of an interesting wow. possibility. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think it trivializes in any way. And I know you're not saying that. No, no, no. Um, the fact that you did the fiction, it was more to say, okay, I've I'm just, just saying, when you're writing some... about ETI in the Catholic Church and you, and you have quotes from his space trilogy, mm-hmm. like, I want people to see, okay, there's a reason for that. You know, yeah. we're, not, we're not citing yeah. science fiction as, you know, a, well, you know a, a, a great theological source, but it is reflective of a great thinker's thought. Yeah, and I, I start out with his nonfiction essays where he just lays things right. out beautifully, and this says, and to illustrate this, here's, yeah. here's the science fiction. Yeah, so um, that's awesome. And he's not the only one, you know, who's done that. Um, you you also have a, a you know a novel that was written oh when would that have been sixties seventies, um, with that in the future a Jesuit <laughs> a scientist we're engaged in interplanetary space travel goes to another planet and is is uh, part of a team, not as yeah. a Jesuit, but as a scientist, that, discovers yeah. should we have, uh, should we open up this planet to human contact? And and it just it goes on. It's so funny. Um, one of the Jesuits at the, the Vatican Observatory was commenting on the book, and he said, said, well, you know, it's very imaginative and everything, but it's it's bad theology. It's not even Jesuit theology. I, I, I saw <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Not even Jesuit theology. <laughs> not even theology. Jesuit theology. <laughs> <laughs> but it that opens up really you know, questions about stuff. That's really so, good. But it is... Uh, reading a book like that, it prompts you to think about yeah. all kinds of things you hadn't thought about. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, you got you got Lewis, you got Padre Pio, you got JP2, Newman. Uh, you know, uh, it's amazing. So, um, but I wanted to I wanted to turn to like a totally different subject now. Um, I thought we would turn to, you know, and you actually m- just mentioned um, in C.S. Lewis. Uh, a, a possessed human who goes to, you know, the other planet. But let's let's get into a question that a lot of people have about our our UFO encounters, uh, demonic activities, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you know, I think a lot of Catholics may say, "Okay, Paul, I get it. The tradition, the tradition is clear. You can believe." in aliens. You can believe in multiple universes. You can believe in things, you know. But the the stuff that we experience is demons. I think a lot of people mm-hmm. would argue that. So we're kind of changing changing subjects here, but it's it's something that's very interesting to a lot of people. Now, again, as I kind of started this whole conversation, you're a guy with credentials. And in terms of the demonic stuff, you're a guy with credentials. So you're the author of Tan's Tan's book, Manual for Spiritual Warfare, which still just sells like crazy. Um, you have been educated, informed, and participated in exorcisms and, you know, exorcists education and all of their, you know, background. So you know, you know the work of the devil um, better than most. So 
Um, well, let me ask you, is that fair to say? I mean, you've, you've had quite a lot of education and experience yeah. in that, in that area. Yeah. I mean, obviously exorcist for a layman, exorcist would for, know a lot more, but for a yeah. layman. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about it. Uh, when they have these abductions and people, you know, um, or whatever, whatever they experience, how do we know if it's not just straight up demonic possession, demonic activity? It's a great question, and you know, I talk about it in the book, and I'm sure I'll be hearing from from some folks who, who do seem to they well, they've spoken openly about believing that both both Catholics and their fundamentalist Christian, Christian, you know, Protestant Christians and others. Um, I think you know the the straightforward answer is this that that it does seem to me that some of the so-called abduction experiences, where people testify that they've been taken away, they think they're on a ship or whatever, and seeing these creatures and often they're put under physical examination and then they're taught things and that kind of stuff. That there are certainly cases of that that seem to parallel demonic encounters from from history. And no, but are there even, any are there any is there any evidence that in in, ex, in possessions that like the bodies move somewhere else or is it just like a mental experience of that? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, could could be both. I don't, you know, I, again, I don't rule anything out. <laughs> right. And there is some evidence that there are some cases, and I think it's important to say that, um, <clears throat> where a believing Christian is having an abduction experience or what they believe is, and when they say in the name of Jesus, you know, leave me alone, that it, it ends. And it ends. And so those kinds of things lead me to believe that, yes, and especially if it's an occasion where the aliens are, trying to convince the people of a different religion that they've, they're the space brothers or whatever who have come to earth and all your religions are wrong but we're going to lead you to the truth sounds a lot like what happened in other situations in history Muhammad, Muhammad Joseph Smith where uh, appearing as the, an angel of light but the one I'm true religion you, right, this now, is, I'm going to give you the, the, the true real revelation now. the yeah. real revelation so yeah. If there's if there's legit ETs, they're probably not coming here to try to give us the real revelation, right? So I, I mean, don't but, think so. But especially if they're combined with accounts of people being taken against their will, of being physically harmed, especially accounts of I don't get too graphic, but sexual encounter, that kind of thing, sure sounds a lot like those. And even secular sounds like demonic writers, activity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even secular writers have have noted that um, who who aren't Christians at all, but they just say, "Gosh, this sounds a lot like." So I need to say, first of all, yes, I think some of the encounters probably are. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty good evidence. Yeah. But what I don't agree with is folks who, are, who jump from that to saying, therefore, everything having to do with UFOs or extraterrestrial intelligence or whatever is diabolical. That said, don't even talk about it. Don't get me involved in a conversation. Um, and there are plenty of you know, those folks out there. And um, It's just you, you can't jump to yeah. a generalization like that. If... if the U.S. government, as there seems to be plenty of evidence, really does have retrieved material from, from crashed UFOs. If they're traveling around. They have evidence that these things are physical objects and moving, you know, all kinds of, of ways. Uh, demons don't need that to get around. Right. You know, demons are, don't even have physical bodies there. Um, and, and a lot of the things don't have any, don't have any evil or menacing aspects to them at right. all they're just uh, appearing i mean i suppose there might even be somewhere they're seeing an angel and don't realize it but um so you just can't what was that i suppose there could be cases where somebody's seeing something bright in the sky and somehow oh. it's an angelic appearance i right. don't know right could be uh, right. could be but you just can't paint with a broad brush the whole thing because a few of them seem to be that yeah. way. yeah so but i do want to <laughs> like there's a there's a i've seen a number of ufo documentaries and stuff and one of the popular dudes who is on all those things he basically holds what I'd call like a seance where they get around, they sit, mm-hmm. they sit Indian style and they like <coughs> welcome the aliens to communicate with mm-hmm. them tel- telepathically. Right. That does not look healthy to me. That's, that's very dangerous. And even people who involved in all this, not, not in doing that, but in studying these things who have, don't seem to have any explicit faith have warned people like that saying, yeah. That's very dangerous. You don't know what these entities are. You better not be right. inviting them in. And so even from a non-religious point of view, it's a very dangerous thing to do. But as a Catholic, we can look at that and say, you and say might that, think you're welcoming mm-hmm, in Martians, mm-hmm. but you could be welcoming in Beelzebub. Exactly. So yeah. don't yeah, do don't that. Don't do that. Right. right. So I'm glad you made that point. Yeah. So that's that's all of one piece of the kind of thing we're talking about. That You shouldn't be trying to, I think, seek contact that way, and you definitely... Um, 
don't want to be believing when stories say, oh, the Space Brothers are here to give us the real religion. Don't be falling right. for that. Right. There are whole new religions that have been created out of the kind of modern UFO experience. Yeah. And, you know, Scientology, Ron Hubbard was actually a science fiction yeah. writer who, by his own admission, just kind of made made up the religion. Which I don't, I don't understand how these competent, wealthy, celebrity people fall into that. Like, I don't get it. And maybe that's another conversation. But, I mean... Yeah. How is it that they buy into the Scientology theology? Or maybe they don't. Maybe they just see it's like a mythology and they're doing it for some philosophical reason. But when you do read the theology of L. Ron Hubbard, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad science And fiction. I'm not even sure he believed it. You know, I think there's good evidence he probably didn't. But, but anyway, again, the point I'm just making is that there, are, there have been entire new religions I used to study New American Religions. That was part of my field of study. And yeah. They've come up with this stuff based on that kind of thing with this notion that, I mean, it's even more widespread than that. You, you have some Christian theologians who have described it as the ETI myth, which is that somehow we'll find our salvation by, by extraterrestrials who come down and they've learned by now hmm. that if they survive long enough to get this kind of technology, then they must have gotten past organized religion and all this stuff and know the truth about everything. So if they come then we have to accept their religion because that yeah. must be the real That's just, uh, you know. <laughs> well, th- all right, good. So we covered kind of the demonic, and that's, that's <clears throat> you've made it very clear, and I think that's important. And, they sh- you know, definitely the demonic is involved in some of these things because you shouldn't be doing seances to begin with. and um, But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, all right, so if there are real encounters, <clears throat> visitations, whatever we want to call it, how in the world they get here? Like how, you know, I mean, talk to me a little bit about, you know, how they're going to travel across the galaxy or the universe. Mm-hmm. I mean, you must have given thought to this, yeah, you know. Yeah. So how is a, I mean, this isn't a theological question, I guess, or is mm-hmm. it? I don't know mm-hmm. what it is. I don't know what it is. But, I mean, if we're talking about aliens and being visited by aliens, and some of them aren't aliens, some of them are demons, you know, but if some of them maybe could be ETIs, how did they get here? You know, I've... First, I want to refer back to St. Augustine and the whole thing about the antivities, that I don't want to make that mistake of saying that since the technology of Zenoa doesn't allow for this, therefore it can't be. Right. Um, if you study the evolution of science, scientific thought, the paradigm shifts, as they've been described by Kuhn, that um, Copernicus was one of them, but that science itself is always in process, and that we discover things that we once thought couldn't be, are, and technologies that we once thought uh, were impossible, we find are possible. I mean, there's a time when it was a popular notion that, that if you went more than like 50 miles an hour or something in a vehicle, it would kill you or something, you know, just, wow. um, <clears throat> and so what we have to do is say, all right, first of all, science itself is never settled. People talk about follow the science and all kinds of things, but science is never settled. And Never um, settled? Settled, yeah. yes. Yeah. And uh, especially with regard to cosmology, the origins of the universe and the shape and the size, and physics, and especially astrophysics. One of the points I make in my book is Even that Even propulsion. Especially right? I mean, propulsion. propulsion. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm getting to. So oh, the, No, that's all right. The, um, so you have folks like David Wilkinson, who's written this great book on science and religion regarding this, and, uh, and he has PhDs in science as well as religion. So let him do that. I'm not a scientist. But the reason I don't deal with it in my book is that, and it, for me, in the end, that can't settle whether they have come here or not or whether they exist. One of the big questions that people said, uh, Fermi's paradox, by a guy named Fermi, that, um, that Fermi said, well, if they exist, what, where are they? Why, Why they haven't here? they come? Yeah. And that. Yeah, how do you respond to that? That's a good one. Oh, because that, that begs the question, or, you know, are they not here? What about all these testimonies of people Ooh. who say that they are? Ooh. I mean, that's that's some kind of like Balducci. We're going to talk about that. Well, that, that too. Then. We're going to talk there. But I mean, is, are they not here, f- f- the visitors the, and the things that we're seeing, that the Navy pilots are seeing? Um, you're saying from the beginning, why haven't they come? Well, you don't know that they haven't come. There's hmm. sure there, there are thousands of people who say, I have seen this stuff. I've encountered yeah. these things. Um, <clears throat> so that, but, but cutting edge technology. Uh, with regard to propulsion, uh, with regard to and, and quantum physics, oh my goodness, you, you get into that and you start seeing there's all kinds of stuff we don't begin to understand. 
<clears throat> but there, I mean, there's serious studies being government funded about how you might be able to use gravity in such a way that you can bend the fabric of space and time in such a way that you bring two things together, they come across what would have been a really big space. Yeah. And you actually get possible hints of that with some of the testimonies like of Navy Pilot, you know, who gets close to one of these things and his whole perception of time changes. He thinks it's been this time, it's actually this time. Um, oh, wow. Other kinds of things happen. I hadn't heard that. Mm -hmm. I've heard Tic Tac and everything, but I haven't <clears throat> heard about any kind of like disorientation or whatever you want to call that by the pilot. Yeah, That's so cool. he has a record of how long it actually lasted, but in his perception it was something different. Wow. The fact that the way cool. some of them appear, there seems to be almost like plasma <laughs> around it. Which, I mean, I don't wanna, can't get into details, and again, I'm not a scientist, but that – yeah, I think it's. I think it really is possible yeah. that we cannot deny the possibility of people come up, up creatures coming from other stars simply because our science doesn't allow for right. it. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, Napoleon would have thought that you know a single airplane was otherworldly. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Right. So I mean, they yeah. just um, they could not imagine. Our technology, right? Our cell phones have more power in it yeah. than Apollo 13. Well, just whatever, like Augustine right? could, could not imagine Get somebody sailing on the other side to the other right. side of the ocean. Yeah. Um, what's an ultra terrestrial? Well, it's, a, it's kind of a, I think, probably a pretty recent term. That's the notion that, uh, let's say, a concept that there could be non human intelligence that actually is terrestrial. Oh. But other than us. Okay, so that's not aliens that are, like, <coughs> here living in the Pacific Ocean. That's Well, that's one of the possibilities. Okay. That they actually are, or at least for some time. Maybe they started out aliens, so they've lived here a long you know, time. They under the ocean, that kind of thing. They've been sharing the planet with us for a while. But the term refers more to they are, they're not from another place. They're from here? Or, or, or at least in their there. residence. It doesn't necessarily okay. refer to their, their origin, okay. No, okay. but they're gotcha. resident okay. here and... And perhaps so they could have come time. from somebody somewhere else, but yeah, but okay. have been here a long time, right? And so that would include, you know, so many of the sightings and stuff that they're coming in and out, out of the water, water. Should, yeah, yeah, transmedium uh, flight where they they come from space to the atmosphere to the water and back, which is far beyond any technology. I mean, like have. you know, I'm not a scientist at all, but I mean, I've heard that we know more about <clears throat> our solar system than we know about our ocean. Yeah, you know? for sure. So. And the ocean's pretty darn deep. Yep. So, yep. you know, if you wanted to hide, it's one thing to go and, like, try to hide behind the moon. It's another thing because we can see you go there the whole way, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. But to just go straight down, you can't see them. can't detect them at all, right? So that's an interesting theory. Except that <laughs> Navy submarines have. Have been seeing things. Well, they, they have the tracking stuff. Uh -huh. And they're going, you know, incredible speeds under the water. Wow. And uh, and then we've got you know some of the the video of the thing coming down. It came something like eighty thousand feet in just a few seconds whew, down, and then hits the water. It doesn't break the water. Just goes down. It doesn't break the they water. They send they send, I mean it doesn't make a splash. Right, or right, anything. right, right. They send submarine out after it, and they can't find it right away. It's just I mean it's, again I'm not it's saying awesome. this is all proof. No, it's awesome. I'm just saying that it needs to open up our minds. To <laughs> That's <possibilities>. awesome. <laughs> That's so, so cool. <laughs> That's so cool. All right. So. Um, so we've talked about uh, demons. Now let's um, kind of kind of like to go to some more of the very specific theological questions that people end up having for Catholics. You know, okay, if aliens ex exist, then what do you do with this and that, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of going into kind of going into that. Mm -hmm. So let's first talk about uh, any potential relationship with with Jesus Christ and the impacts mm -hmm. on this. Um, so, and, and we've been hinting at it. Some of this will repeat, but, you know, you can't do this conversation perfect, like perfect linear, you know, yep. style. Yeah. Uh, so the hypostatic union, you've talked a little bit about this, mm -hmm. but if there are aliens out there, um, could Jesus have taken on three, 10, 15 natures? What do you say? It sure seems possible to me. I don't see anything in theology or tradition that would forbid that. Again, I mentioned St. Thomas, who's such it a It would be the same person. Us. It would be the same person, and that's part of what we have to understand. The Nestorian heresy, you know, the, the book has to get back into this kind of thing, and it does. Um, 
was, was the notion that when the Son of God became man, he took on a man, an entire man, joined himself to it. They had a union only of wills. But it was two persons together. I call it the committee Jesus. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's two persons, divine and human. Right. And that was Nestor. And that's what Nestorius. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was actually patriarch of Constantinople. It was a great, you know, yeah. big important bishop. Um, and for that reason, he said in his church, you cannot refer to Mary as mother of God. She's only Mary, mother of Christ or of the man. Yeah. So because yeah. there are two persons there, and she is only mother of the man. But the church came back and finally had a council to have to define it. That he is only one person, and he has taken on our nature and joined to his nature. So who is he? He is the divine son of God from before all eternity. Um, he has taken on a full human nature, even a, a human will along with his divine will, the body, every soul, everything. But it's not another man. It's not a, a complete man because that would be basically an elevated form of the Holy Spirit indwelling in a prophet. You know, you've got God and you've got the man who's the prophet. It's really not, ultimately, it's not any different from that. This is something categorically different. All right. Um, <clears throat> and so you have some modern th- theologians who talk about this as if they never say their story, it's but they sound like it, where they'll say, yes, and so if the Son of God was incarnate, you know, in Jesus Christ, then he could be incarnate with this, and these two would not really have anything to do with each other, and they're not rivals, but this one could even be more important than that one. You're talking as if they're two different persons. Yeah, no, yeah. they're not. Right. It's only one person, the divine Son of God, the Word of God, who from before all time has existed and created all things, came to our planet and took on a human nature. He's still only one person. And if he took on a nature there, he would still be the same person. Yeah. Not multiple lords, not multiple saviors, not multiple... Sons of God, just one son of God who takes on a second nature. All right, and so Aquinas himself, you know, said just in human terms, he, he couldn't see why, why that couldn't happen in human terms. All right, so I'm going to get weird. But here. God had not done it. I'm going to get weird and hard here. So if like, Christ has a glorified body in heaven right now, all right, if he had other natures, how would he pull that off? Well, I've thought about it, and I... I think it's just possible, <clears throat> for instance, that, I mean, it's no problem for him to have the multiple bodies, for sure. How would we view him would be, to me, the question. <clears throat> maybe uh, maybe each race would, would see simply the body, the, you know, the form that he, the body that he took on, the nature that mm. he took on okay. of theirs. <clears throat> but we're going to, you know, the whole notion of salvation, it's, it's not just eternal fire insurance, it's... That we will have a, a share in God's own nature, His love, His wisdom, His knowledge. We will be able to see as God sees, wow. and to love as God loves. So, however it is that God would see that, we'll see it that way. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, next kind of strength, if you're talking about incarnations, could the could you 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 throw out there at least somebody raise the topic of the Father or the Holy Spirit being incarnated? I mean. What's illogical about that? What's impossible about that? I mean, there, why, why couldn't they have been? Nothing I can see. I mean, I'm not convinced. Obviously, this, I haven't convinced any of this has happened. It's just right. that it could be. Uh, you do have some theologians who just say, of course. Um, seems to me possible, but it, I don't think we know enough yeah. to know that maybe there's something in the inner nature of God that that rules that out that yeah. we don't know about. Or don't I have fun thinking about that. I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing and you know on that topic for uh, us humans like why why was the son the one incarnated Mm -hmm. versus the holy spirit or the father i mean what and it's a good question i wonder if not because it was through him that the world was made you're right so he's like all right i'll go fix it since it got messed up (laughs) this is my job well just that yeah the father you know he comes forth from the father he creates the world the Holy Spirit comes to sustain and enliven and bring life but and if, all those if things. If the world is created through him, then he has to clean it up. Not that he has to, but maybe it was fitting for him to do that. Right. Yeah. All right. That's awesome. Um, all right. Um, so, and we talked about this briefly, but the cosmic Christ. So mm-hmm. the question, legitimate theological question, did his redemptive act cover the possible sins of other possible races all the way out there, or would the poor guy have to be incarnated 
you know, 87 other times and undergo 87 passions. Okay, so you got several parts to this. Yeah, so there is. Yeah. De- I know I'm packing it. There's, in. there's definitely a debate about that. Okay, um, so first of all, the debate would be there are people. I mean, Lewis has, you know, even talked about this possibility, but there are people who th- who thought that we're we're the only ones who fell. There's not even need for an incarnation. Otherwise, that uh, Lewis once he he speculated that the reason the scripture says that even angels long to look on what's going on here is that we're in quarantine from the rest of the universe. And that's one reason why God puts such cosmic distances between us wow. and the others. But he's not the only one. There have been plenty plenty of others who say, I mean, going back centuries, who say, um, uh, like Leibniz, I think it was, who, who often he was, you know, philosopher thought that, that this is the best of all possible universes. And then people like Voltaire and stuff would come back and say, oh, yeah, well, it's terrible. It's right. like that. And he'd say, well, actually, this is the worst possible well i'm paraphrasing but basically we're saying this is the worst possible world in the best, in possible, the best universe. possible universe we are i mean when i'm said what goes on on earth it could very well be that that all the sin and stuff here is is you know of no account to the rest of the universe than than a, a fly would be in a dragon a dungeon somewhere <laughs> it's um so anyway all this to say that uh if there are they don't have to be fallen if they're fallen um they could be redeemed in other ways. Saint, again, St. Thomas says, we, uh, when, when someone asked the question, did, did Jesus have to be incarnate? And did the Son of God have to be incarnate in the passion? And he says that's the way he did it, um, but he could have done it in other ways, even for us. And so, yeah, he could have done it in other ways. And some of the theologians I'll look at, they had all kinds of possibilities. There are, there's another tradition um, Duns Scotus and others, uh, who said, I think that the Son of God would be incarnate even if we hadn't fallen as an act of, of loving union with the human race. I think An- Anselm and Duns Scotus both said that. So uh, I think it was Anselm. Um, have, but I know Scotus did, and then the same, I think who, about uh, ontolog- Anselm's ontological argument, yeah. Oh, so mm-hmm. yeah, Anselm and Duns Scotus. Duns Scotus, just so our viewers know, you know, he was the one who really led the charge on the Immaculate Conception, mm-hmm. the Franciscan. Mm-hmm. About the same time as Aquinas, somewhere around there. Yeah, maybe a little, so, a little after. A little yeah, after but he, yeah. he really pushed for the Immaculate Conception, right? So another serious thinker. Blessed. He's a blessed. Don't go to us. So, sorry, I got I – got, so you're saying that he – and then uh, there were others. And I, I read, Richard and others, yeah, after yep, him. Uh-huh. That the incarnation would have happened whether or not we fell. Either way. And, and my understanding from reading that years ago – I'm going off – this is 20 years old in my head – but that the – the glory of the incarnation, of the Creator becoming the created, that magnificent act was, you know, even more glorious, even greater than our redemption. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, our redemption is great. Yeah, that's great. But it's just kind of about us. But, but God becoming His His creation was even more glorious. Mm-hmm. And so, so we're actually kind of looking at like almost a secondary, uh, you know, um, result or whatever of the incarnation. The first is just the unification of the divine and the created. That, if you think about it, that's remarkable. Because we think about all of all the incarnation for the purpose of the cross, for right. the purpose of right. the resurrection, for the purpose of getting us out of trouble, right? But, but actually, that him becoming one of us, and you know that that was far more glorious than Connor Gallagher's salvation. Yeah, you know, so yeah. that's that's pretty that's pretty awesome. So anyway, so that's just there could have been so that's, other yeah. <clears throat> incarnations, and there and they and might not even involve a passion. Exactly, but, uh, it might not even been fallen. Yeah, so. and not involve a passion, but just an act of of loving union. So there are all kinds of you know possibilities here again, um, but also possibilities that there would be a a race that. Um, God gave them, like the angels, their choice at the beginning. And then when they, the ones who chose against, the, they're confirmed in that choice, and there's no possibility for redemption now. Yeah, so the, alien, the, the a, aliens, the angels, they get one decision, boom, right? Are you with me or not? Kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. they, they leave, they fall, and there's no, there's no second chance. That's right. Yes. And why did they not get another chance? But we do, right? I get a chance every day. 
So why? Is it because they had such a deeper understanding that they their first decision was their final decision because they just had a clear understanding and I'm too, I'm too ignorant, so I have, God's like, come on, come on. Well, there, yeah, theologians would say that. We're born in ignorance. We're born in weakness, even after a baptized concupiscence. So he gives us other chances. But they they were perfect in how they were, you know, and they had a knowledge of him, acquaintance of him that we, you know, we don't have. And that the act that they made was something they, an act they made with all that they were. For us, we can make the choice or something. It's just kind of part of our mind. Okay, their act is with like all that. that they are. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean like, that's, that's yeah. kind of my way of putting it. That's cool. So that they made an act that was irrevocable. Yeah. You know, a choice that was irrevocable. They made it with all they were, and then God confirms that. And we kind of, we make decisions that are sort of like, <clears throat> here's 3% of me, or here's 30% of me. You know, we kind of put different levels yeah. of skin in the game. Yeah. They put the whole thing in because yeah. they're angels, right? Yeah. I mean, so. So, I mean, there, there are probably other reasons we, we just don't know, but... If he did it, because so there are folks who say, well, of course he wouldn't create a race that um, that he at this point is not going to redeem. That's contrary to his nature. Well, no, it's not contrary to his nature. That's what he's done with the angels. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that you could have a race that's partly fallen, partly not. What if in our in Adam's race, what was done in Adam and Eve through original sin that became the condition for the whole race, but with the angels it wasn't. You know, there was an individual choice and an individual consequence. So what if God created a race where each of them had an individual choice, individual consequence? Interesting. Okay, so like, so Adam and Eve, at least our story, <clears throat> as we understand it, sent into the world before they had children. Mm-hmm. So if they'd had children and you get down to like, you know, third or fourth generation and Cain's over in this city and Abel's over in this farm country, <laughs> right? And they got, you know, but then Cain is an idiot and he eats the forbidden fruit, you know, and Abel doesn't. <laughs> so then, then you have cousins, you know, within the human race. We're all sons of Adam, but one one fell and one now has sinned and the other doesn't. I mean, I guess that's in theory. That Maybe that's a possible. Yeah. Uh, so is that what okay. you sort of meant? Like that, That's what I'm saying. Yeah. The, the, I mean, it's just throwing out the possibility. Yeah, I'm that's not a the, fascinating I'm not thing the first one to think of it. I've never thought that. That you could encounter Gosh. a race where you have some of them are fallen, some are not. Yeah. Um, and some of them are falling and will eventually fall, and others will never fall, you know, until, you know, they'll make it to heaven. Oh, that's awesome. So that's part of what you have to understand is you've got all those, all those possibilities. Right. Um, so no necessity that he would have been incarnate anywhere else. And then the other possibility is that his incarnation here, so to get back to the original point, um, could have consequences for right. extraterrestrial races. Right. And uh, <clears throat> and that the redemption and you get hints of this in some of the Eastern fathers, maybe, where you know the blood of Calvary washed the whole universe. You know, like kind of the, you know, statements like that. Yeah, yeah. So that's but that's one side. But then there's the other side, you know. And I kind of find myself caught between them. I, I see both as possible. But the other side is this goes back again to ancient heresies and the church's teaching. Um, once it was clear that there were um, or, or b- before all the things about the nature of Christ were clear. There was a debate about uh, how much of the human nature might have been replaced by the divine nature instead of joined to it. So what do I mean by that? Apollinaris taught that in the incarnation, the divine Son of God unites to human nature, but the human nature is missing the the higher into a higher part of the rational soul. Right. Because, because the word of God takes the place, takes of, the place that. of that. Right. Uh huh. And the church had to come back and, and the 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 motto kind of, of of the thing was whatever has not been assumed, whatever part of the nature has not been taken on to the divine nature is not healed. So we would have parts of human nature that were not healed if they were not included in the incarnate nature taken on. Hmm. And for that reason, then, that it was declared, you know, heresy, that, heresy. no, there was a full human nature in right. Christ. And and then there are all kinds of corollaries to, you know, to that. You have passages in the book of Hebrews and other places where it talks about in order to, for Christ to, you know, be our Redeemer, he had to be one of us and take our place as our representative and, um, and then they would say they didn't have to, right? I mean, he could have done. Well, it. given the way it was, given the way it was set up, yeah, he could have done it any way he wanted to, right? I mean, couldn't he snap his fingers and say, 
Yeah, we're done. Yeah, the way Aquinas handles that is he says there are passages of the scripture like when Jesus says the son of man must die and all that. There are people who take that to mean absolutely must, but he says no, God could have done it anyway. But once God set into plan his right. into motion his plan, it had to happen this way. Right, right. right. So that's that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So given all that, um, and then just at a practical level, uh, well, several questions would come up. Okay. If, the cons- if there were consequences for salvation of extraterrestrial races, um, how would they even know about it? Mm. And you get a similar thing when they meet the, the peoples of the New World. You know, the church has finally said that there is possibility of salvation for people who never had a chance to hear it. Like, so it's possible. But you start thinking about, um, you know, salvation requires somehow the cooperation of the will, even if, if it's a will that's in darkness about things. Um, and people will come up with ideas like saying, well, God could have given them prophets to tell them about what happened on earth, or angels could have told them or stuff. It could be. Um, <clears throat> but for me, the even deeper issue is that the kind of incarnation we had, for him to do the work he did, or the way he did it anyway, was to be one of us mm-hmm. and to take on everything that we are. And then that nature was crucified, that nature um, that person took our place. Yeah. Imagine now that you're an alien and something very different. I mean, who, who knows? Maybe you're reptilian. Maybe you're insectoid. Maybe maybe you look kind of like us, but you're not really much like us. How does that work yeah. then for him to become one of us? How would it work in the same way? If it worked, right. it would have to work in a different way. Right. I mean, you, you might have, I mean, what would the divine heart devotion mean to a race that didn't even have hearts? Right. You know, physical hearts. Right. Um, how could how could they relate to a savior who did not share their nature, and how could he represent them except to the most basic level that he took on matter? Yeah. Um, how how could uh, he be their representative? Yeah. May, and maybe he could. So again, I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying that I have to give full weight to both sides of that issue. The first, yeah. that yes, he certainly could have consequences and that kind of thing because his his blood is of infinite precious value and that kind of thing. But at the same time, when you start looking more at the practical side of it, how would that work? Yeah. Either at the end of life or something, it'd have to be some revelation or an angel would have to tell them for them to accept it. But even then, I mean, think about it. If our gospel was that the the one who created all things became a reptilian creature, you know, a million light years from here, yeah. and that saves us, uh, okay, but... I'm not, um, I'm not probably joining up very quickly. <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. And that's not to, you know, I'm not trying to be flippant about this but it's, no, it's no, a r- very real issue if the, they are not of the race of that and that's the other thing I mean, things in scripture are talking about he's the new Adam okay so if your race didn't descend from Adam doesn't have Adam's the original sin flowing from what Adam did is that even your situation right you know at all it's a, yeah. well so the way you I guess this Christology I guess is the way you have to answer the issues of Mary, right? <coughs> so, mm-hmm. mediatrics of all graces, all right? That's what we say. Mm-hmm. Is she the mediatrics of graces for the the Martians? You know? That depends. All is a big word. Yeah, and that's I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things in Scripture you find is that there'll be words like world, all, that kind of thing. Does all mean absolutely all, or is it kind of a limited all? All that's for a, us. Yeah, is yeah. it and for whom? And a perfect example I know of that is, uh, you know, when when someone will say to me, "He's not Catholic." Well, all have sinned, Romans says, and fallen short of the grace of God, uh, the glory of God. So Mary can't have been born without sin. Right. I say, so you're saying all means every, absolutely every single human being who ever lived is has not been without sin. Said, yeah, that's it. Okay, Jesus? so Jesus sinned. Right. right. So, oh, but that's different. Well, no, what you're saying is there all is an exception. All. all but doesn't mean all, right. And it's the same thing here. And when you go to look at the biblical passages that talk about all and the cosmos and stuff, so for me as an historical theologian, say, okay, is it reasonable to think that it could mean something besides all, all absolute all? And then you start looking at how Chrysostom or Aquinas or others interpreted these verses, and they were all over the place. And a bunch of them said, no, it doesn't mean all, all. <laughs> it means all humans, or it means humans and angels, or it means all humans who have been redeemed. Mm. And so you realize that it's we can't assume that it's talking about all extraterrestrial yeah. races, that it, 
a lot of it just seems to be talking about the earth or even in the catechism where we'll talk about our place and that kind of thing sounds great. And then you look at a parallel passage in the catechism and it says of all the creatures on earth, we're the highest kind of thing. And you say, okay, that seems to be understood. Yeah. And what they're saying. Yeah. So with her, with, with Mary, it's, it's a lovely thing to think about. Um, First of all, we don't even know whether other races even need to be born, whether there even is such a thing as motherhood. Oh, they wow. could be naturally cloned. <laughs> Man, could be, it's amazing. You know, like, you just naturally things. just take our own experience mm -hmm. and put and them on other. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so that could be the poss possibility. But the other thing um, is that even if he actually had a mother in him, you know, with, because of his, the nature he takes on, that, um, that doesn't lower her. You know, if she's the mediatrix of all graces, then yeah, I could say all graces to us. But there's a sense in which one way that the incarnation can affect the rest of the universe is that it completes the plan of God. And what I mean is this. It's a wonderful analogy I borrowed from another writer, but uh, and he's not even talking about ETI, but he says that um, when St. Paul talks about all the creation is groaning and waiting for the sons of God you know, to be, be redeemed, um, that... One way that could be is that um, it's like a great symphony where you've got a soloist who's got this important part, and he goes to play and he fails to play. Mm. The whole symphony is now incomplete mm. because of that one actor's failure, and that until the, the soloist gets it right, the whole thing is still incomplete. And it's a lovely Im you know, Im yeah. imagery to think of that in that sense, it could be that creatures, intelligent creatures of other races, that they're all waiting for our salvation to be complete too, because the entire symphony of, of the universe won't be complete until yeah. every part gets fixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's a beautiful analogy. Um, changing subjects completely. Uh, little green guys land on the <laughs> front lawn of the White House. Do you baptize them? Well, there's actually been some, some playful talk about that at, at the Vatican, but um, that gets back to the same question we've been talking about. First, you have to find out um, what awareness they have, of, of all, if at all, of their creator, and get some sense of whether they're fallen or not. That might take a little while to figure out. Um, whether they may have, if they come to you and say, imagine the wise, the wise men, the magi, you know, they come, this farm country, and they get there, and they say, well, we've been told, we've got a star, whatever's been told us, that he's, he's the Savior, he's, he's the King, and we want to adore him. Well, I can imagine a similar kind of thing, where somebody shows up and says, we had prophets who told us on this planet, or, or here, was someone who is going to complete us, or redeem us. So in that case, maybe, <laughs> um, if they ask for it, but, but it's something, that obviously, the church would have to make a ruling about Way back, I mean, centuries ago, somebody raised the issue, and he wasn't, I think it was Lutheran, maybe, he wasn't Catholic, and he may have been po poking fun, at the, a little fun at the Catholic Church, not malicious. But he was saying, so if that happens, um, you know, he wants to be baptized, and the church would have to probably call it a communical council yeah. to decide whether to <laughs> baptize him or not. And that uh, the big question would be, okay, what if he wants to be ordained? And then he says, but he thinks they would probably say on practical grounds that, uh, we better not ordain them. You know, we can baptize them conditionally, but there's no conditional ordination, so we probably better not ordain. So he's he's probably being tongue in cheek. But he, centuries ago, he was raising that issue. Actually, I can see certain orders being willing to take. <coughs> yes, them on I get too. Them. I won't mention them, but that's awesome. <laughs> um, I don't know if we should go here or not, but it's on my list. So at lunch, we talked about Neanderthals. <laughs> this is fascinating. This is fascinating, and it like. All right, I'll just I'll just be quiet. But I'll, how in the world does the Neanderthal situation factor into this alien conversation? And it's 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 fascinating to me. So just let it rip. Okay. Well, I mentioned it in the last in the section, I think, about ultraterrestrials that um, the notion of an intelligent race living on Earth that's not human, we may have already we may already know about, but it could be. The Denis Denisovans and the Neanderthals um, depends on whether they actually are part of our lineage somehow or right. not. Right. Whether the but, Neanderthal was a son of Adam. Yeah. Or right. Or not. Not right. Now, I mean, I think I would be willing to guess, Paul, that 
most people, I mean, it's pretty <coughs> obvious that Neanderthal existed. I don't think anybody's debating that, yeah. right? We got mm -hmm. the skeletons. It's pretty clear. And no one, I don't think anyone's going around saying this is a big, you know, forgery, like the missing link oh, forgery. Right. No, you know, no, this is like yeah. the real thing. So, you know, but I, I sort of, I guess, always assumed that the Neanderthal was a son of Adam and it was just like a weird, a weird branch or something, but I guess not. So talk, I mean, what do you, what's your thought? Yeah, I mean, that? We, we don't know. We, um, that w one of the, th there are a lot of places where the, the Catholic Church says, okay, fo just follow the science and. Um, one place where at this point it says whatever the science says, we all come from the same set of parents, and that's been consistent. Adam, I mean, Augustine was talking about it. Others all the way up uh, during the Nazi period when they were trying to say that human origins were multiple, and that's why some of the people we thought were fully human were really subhuman, Jews, oh, Africans, like that. Wow. And he came out with a statement, and after that said, no, we're all of the same human family for same parents. And some of the stuff I'm reading by... People who claim to be Christian theologians are just saying, oh, that's not true. Of course, you know, an original sin is not a, well, the church, you know, that's, that's not part of our teaching. And I believe it's not reality. So part of what you have to understand is, is how that, that might have worked. I've, I've read, in, I think it was in the Catholic thing, a piece where God was speculating that maybe Adam and Eve were Neanderthal um, or pre-Neanderthal or something like that. <clears throat> part of it, and this is one of the things I loved about doing this book is that it, it presses you to think about basic theological questions in new ways, and in doing so, you understand better. So for my own, in my own thinking for a long time, someone just said, what, what constitutes the image of God, human person? I would say f free will and rational intellect, you know, and that seemed that. But then, you know, always the sense... Did you add a moral to, soul to that? Well, that's what I finally did and said, no, it's got to be more than that, especially once you start finding that they're animals that have not exactly rational, but some level of reasoning. Yeah, yeah they um, do. I mean, obviously they have reason to some extent. and all kinds of, even crows. I mean, they have these incredible brains. Um, that kind of thing. And, and uh, so there's something more. And then I started thinking about Neanderthals too, okay? You know, because we have evidence that they made jewelry. They made artifacts of tools. Maybe some evidence that they had, they had some kind of ritual, you know. Um, <clears throat> that sure sounds like. You know, those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, monkey, me. monkeys don't have jewelry. They yeah, just don't have yeah. jewelry, right? So, so yeah, you know, I got to think, okay, what if, you know, what if in addition to, to free will and, and uh, rational intellect, the immortal soul? Isn't that really what sets us off? Mm. And that's something that archaeology can't touch, yeah. anthropology. Um, and sure enough, you know, I think it's in the Book of Wisdom that talks about he's made us in his image, his, in his eternal image. Um, immortality is part of it. And so you're not going to be able to go back through archaeology and find somebody with a particular body type or, you know, jaws with the teeth and stuff and say, these are the first ones. But I think, and I could be wrong, and if the church ever says otherwise, of course I submit to that, that at some point he chose the pair and said, instead of the basically animal soul that you have now, the animating principle, your animating principle will be an immortal spirit. You will live forever. Mm. And that's that was the completing part that was of the completing making them, part. Um, you know, making them in the image of God. Yeah. But they have they have cousins <laughs> down the street that are maybe Neanderthal or something yeah. else where they're functioning but they're not they're they're not human yet. Yeah. And if, I mean this gets kinda of crazy, yeah, but we just start thinking, okay, so where did um, like when Cain, when Cain yeah. went off and found the city, right? like and gets his wife, they come from. I mean, we've well, always struggled <coughs> over the incest question, right? I mean, haven't yeah. we? Hasn't? So in my mind, this is one possibility that then. What, they, what, what is the tradition outside of the Neanderthal conversation? What is the tradition said about the incest issue? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. But uh, I mean, because you can't populate a world without I intercourse. So. You have yeah. to do that, right? So I mean, if you're doing that, and all you have is, so it kind of makes sense to me logically that. That they They're, would be able to marry these others yeah. who don't have immortal souls. Yeah. At the day to day, function pretty much the same, but the children, the of, children such an offs of, of such a mating would be have eternal souls. Yeah. So, like the, Adam's humanity is genetic. Is his, and, you know, his image of God? Yeah. That part of, of God it is, is genetic and goes on. Then we're all descended, and the, and original sin affects all that as well.
I mean, that's, that's this just, is highly I'm just speculative. This out. Of course, highly of course. speculative. But, I know that you're being speculative. I'm being speculative, but yes. it's fun to think about because I mean, <laughs> and it helps us to understand that we may already know of a of an ultra terrestrial race, right? You know, right. To help I mean, us so, understand I mean, so the conne- that it's not yeah, the so co- far outside of possibly right. I mean, the, the the connection of this with this book is that the son of Adam, you know, the, the church doesn't say that the son of Adam is the only thing out there. Right, and so whether it's on Mars, or if it's Neanderthal, or if it's the Seder who you yeah, know, Saint Jerome talked about, yeah. you know these are these are legit questions. So I find that fascinating. Um, yeah, anything else on the Neanderthals, or is that good? That's good. And uh, again, I emphasize this is all speculation, and and I'm still I'm still trying to find a place maybe somebody can help me where. There are geneticists who claim that you can tell by our genes that we don't have a set of first parents. I just want to know the you know the answer to that that because uh, I see you know I have my genetic testing done. I've got the Neanderthal <laughs> genes of some kind. I think we all do at some point. Except Africans have less than others, but um, but if if I could have a great grandparent that I didn't inherit any, didn't of the you tell me at lunch? That's from, why you drag your knuckles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and I told I you could, I want to get that testing done so I can say look. Ashley, my wife, like 18% of me is Neanderthal. <laughs> you you got to go easy on me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that should get me out of some chores or something. So if, you know, uh, if, if you can go back three or four generations and don't seem to have any genetic material from, I mean, they'll tell you. I've, I've actually, I'm, I'm kind of the poster boy for we're all one family. It turns out I have clear genetic evidence, not just of Northern European, which I expected, but also Native American, also Mediterranean, also Sub-Saharan African, so Black African, India, Indian from India, and probably Filipino from East Asia. Wow. Uh, stuff. All of those. It's all of me. But that doesn't mean that those are my only ancestors. In fact, I have you know, charts that can show people that have kept the genealogy that show people who don't fit in those categories. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that you're only getting half your genetic material from each parent, and eventually... This stuff can drop out. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, and maybe somebody could give me a simple answer. If that's the case, how could anyone say for sure that this man's, that this couple's not your ancestor? Right. You know? Interesting. But we'll see. Maybe it. it's a lot more I have to learn about that. That's that's wild. That's that's just fun stuff for me to think yeah. about. Um, all right. So two two last questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, if there's aliens out there, you know. Um, are we going to see them in heaven or are we going to see them in hell? <laughs> um, and you know, do they have, their, do they have their own heaven? Do they have their own hell? How's all this, how's all this pulled together in the end? Yeah. And one of my last chapters is on that, the eschatology of all this, that, um, <clears throat> to a great extent, the last things for us, eschatology depends on the first things, um, what were we created for? What is what I call our spiritual status? Are we? Do we have the immortal soul or not? Do we have free will or not? Do we have the image of God or not? <clears throat> or do we just are we just made for natural happiness? And then the other one is, and how do we respond to God? So, um, what choices have we made? What what kind of redemption did He offer us? If we even needed it? Once you answer those questions, then you start seeing what the possibilities are. So, for creatures, if they exist, that were made just for natural happiness in this world, then they wouldn't even exist for heaven, you know. If there are creatures who um, who are made for the beatific vision, then I expect to see them in heaven. That's what <clears throat> that's what makes heaven heaven is the beatific vision. Um, I had a friend that, <clears throat> excuse me, died a few years ago, and but when he was around, we talk about these things and we joke about how, I mentioned in the book, we joke about how we, we hope to get to heaven and maybe with, in my house, in my father's house or many rooms, Maybe we go to a room and it would look a lot like the, the cantina scene uh, on Tatooine in Star Wars. We got all these creatures just having a, a party. You know, <laughs> we laughed about that, and I said, "Well, I hope maybe now he knows." You know, but <clears throat> that would not take anything away <clears throat> from it for me. I would I would rejoice yeah. at that. <clears throat> you have a beautiful poem by a woman named Alice Maynella, the Catholic. I think she was probably a convert, and she I could I mean I've quoted it in there. I could never r- repeat the words, but it's just beautiful thing talking about at the end in heaven you know she could imagine us taking turns telling what god did on each of our planets wow. to redeem us wow. what form he took what 
you know, and that he had trod the Pleiades and all these other things. And, and sorry, it checks me up. Yeah. And beautiful. then when our turn comes, we yeah. show him a perfect man. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's beautiful. It is. And then hell, well, if they are made for eternal life and they turn away from him, my guess is they'd all be in hell, but hell might have different sections. I mean, yeah, yeah I did a book for us. It's right over there. You know, for Dan, about different visions Saints of hell. Saints who saw and, hell. Yeah. Saints who different saw Different visions hell. of hell. And not that you, all of them are to be taken literally because they aren't all the same, but could very well be different aspects of hell. It just means eternal separation from God, however yeah. that would yeah. manifest itself for that particular race. Yeah, yeah. Well, the last thing, I mean, that's beautiful. That is a beautiful <laughs> thought. Um, right towards your conclusion, you have a section called Humility, Humility, Humility. And we've done a lot of speculative thinking here, um, which we've made plenty of disclaimers of, you know, if the church rules on any of these things, yep. we submit, yep. period. But it's, it doesn't do Holy Mother Church any favors to pretend that she yep. has dictated us thinking certain things when mm -hmm. she hasn't, mm -hmm. you know, any more than it's good to do that with Scripture. You know, let's not put words in Holy Mother's mouth, you know. So, um, so your final section or towards the end, humility, 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 I'll just give you a chance to kind of wrap up this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a man of faith. You are, you are a man of humility. Um, and you're a man of great intellect, but you have approached this subject uh, bravely, co courageously, you know, dealing with certain issues that people don't want to deal with. Uh, it's fun. It's entertaining. But, I mean, look at how you just had a tearjerker moment about, you know, the magnificence of potential multiple races all glorying in God's uh, paradise, you know, at the end. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful thought. Mm -hmm. So probably finishing uh, today where you began this whole thing with humility, humility, humility. Probably a good way to good way to wrap it up. So, last thoughts on how the virtue of humility has been your guiding uh, virtue here, and how anybody reading this book or thinking about these issues should do the same. Yeah, just that we, there's so much we don't know. The um, and so we need humility in our theology. We need humility in our science and technology. You, oh, big time. Um, I have a little section in there quoting some other folks about scientism, mm -hmm. which can be defined as the, the notion that it's not real unless science can measure it and, you know, and understand it. The things that can't be understood by science are, you know, aren't real, can't be. And that we really need humility in, in that regard. We need humility. Some of the, you know, ancient philosophers, I think, I, I don't blame them, but they would have a notion that that would not be fitting for God to do that, it would not be fitting for God to make another race of free will and his, his image and stuff. And, and I always come back and say, well, you know what? The, the people of Jesus' days, when they would hear the gospel, said it wasn't, wouldn't be fitting for God to become a man. It really wouldn't be fitting for him to be born in a stable. And it sure as heck wouldn't be fitting, fitting for him to die on a cross as a criminal. Mm -hmm. What is fitting for God? If it's not contrary to his nature, we have to ask ourselves, what, you know, is there some aspect of his nature that this would actually illustrate the, the beauty, the diversity, the, the plenitude, to use the, the, the old term of God? Humility that if the church does pronounce on it, that, that we submit and say, yep, the church knows better than I do. And just in the end, uh, humility and disagreements about it, that we know we don't have the whole, the whole part of it. But, but it was St. Augustine who had said, someone said, if, he, he once said, if, if you were to ask me what are the ways of God, I would say humility, humility, humility. Yeah. And um, so that's, that's where we end. And I hope to learn a whole lot more. I continue to learn, but I certainly have, have learned a lot about our faith. It's been deepened in me by studying this material. Well, thanks for writing this book, Paul. I mean, thanks for your other books. but Thanks for publishing it, Thanks daughter. for writing this, man. <laughs> and uh, it's just, you know, you got a lot more books in you, but uh, this is a special one. It's been a lifelong journey. I mean, 500 footnotes. 500, no more than that, goodness gracious, 550 footnotes. You know, this was a labor of love. So it's fun, and I hope our customers enjoy it, and I hope people enjoy this video. So God bless you, brother. Thank you. You too, brother. Thanks for having me. All right, me. let's go get a big steak dinner. All right. <laughs> that sounds great. All right, we're done. Thanks.